Good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to the February 23rd meeting of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, there was a meeting for the Board of Sewer Commissioners posted earlier. Uh, we will not be having that meeting. We're going to go right into the Board of Selectmen's meeting. I'd like to note that this time that this meeting is being televised and recorded. And if there is anyone in the audience recording or videotaping, I would ask that they acknowledge so at this time. Michael Rausch from the Enterprise. Thank you. All items within the meeting agenda are subject to deliberation and votes by the Board of Selectmen. I was wondering if we'd also take a moment of silence for our troops and our public safety personnel at this time. <coughs> Thank you all. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Thank you position on that committee. I'll turn it over to you, Chris, if you'd like to introduce the board members and also to introduce the applicant that's come before us this evening. Thank you, Chairman Mealy. To my left, for the school committee, we currently have Matt Stoke on the, to my left, Anne-Marie Cerrone and Heather DiPaolo, Mitch McLean and Judy. <laughs> and Judy um, we are, uh, Ms. Senna, as you're aware, uh, resigned her position a few months ago and in the course of, in the process of, of adding or, or appointing a new member, um, we've received an applicant for this evening's position. You might have documentation to show that we had two applicants. Unfortunately, one of the applicants was unable to uh, fulfill the commitment and has withdrawn her application. So tonight we have uh, Erica Fitzpatrick, who would like to run for the board or like to be appointed to that position. Okay. And I've asked her to come up and sta make a few statements about her um, uh, requ her desire to be Great. serve on the board. Great. Good evening, Erica. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. They'll get it. They'll get it. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to just start off by saying, you know, uh, thanking everyone for having me here tonight. Um, the school committee is definitely a vital part of the community, and I'm happy to just be um, asked to come here tonight. Very good. Um, I figured that I would start just by kind of giving a little background about myself. Certainly. And, uh, there. Uh, I moved here about 17 years ago to Bourne uh, with my husband, and we have four kids in the Bourne public school system. My daughter Olivia is a freshman at the high school, and my son Brady is in seventh grade at the middle school. My daughter Sydney is a uh, sixth grader at the middle school, and my youngest daughter Reese is in third grade at Mr. Bourne in Mr. Brown's class at Bourndale. Uh, so I uh, also would like to just maybe talk about a little bit about um, you know what I do currently I work at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in the communications department so basically uh, overall I deal with the internal and external communications for the institution and more specifically that means that I deal in public relations and media relations so in one day I might take um, a call from an academic at another institution looking for a paper or I might take a call from a reporter at CNN or I might take a call from a tourist looking for some information about what the, the um, where the institution gets its funding or specific projects that they're doing right now and um, I can also do some public events you know, organizing promoting social media things like that Very good. Questions from anyone on the board of selectmen? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Uh, right now, um, well, thank you for your interest in stepping forward. We can't get enough people to serve for these positions, so the fact that you're coming forward with your impeccable re resume is greatly appreciated. Oh, thank and, you. And my question for you is, is the school building committee right now is looking at replacing the people's school, either with a building on site a rehab of the existing people's school, which is the last option, or expanding the Borndale Elementary School. One of the options is taking the fifth grade out of the Bourne Middle School and maybe putting it back into the elementary school. What is your opinion? Should, should the fifth grade stay in the middle school, or should they be, go back to the elementary level and why? Uh, 
I haven't uh, been able to attend any of the meetings thus far. Uh, they just haven't coordinated into my schedule. So I wouldn't really feel that I'm at, at a place of, of knowledge where I could give an opinion. I don't know what any of the plans have asserted in terms of uh, what that would mean by bringing the fifth grade back, how they would accommodate that at Borndale, but I don't know what any of the other extraneous plans were for uh, any anything. So I would say that I definitely don't have an opinion. Uh, I would definitely need to attend some of the meetings and get more background before I you know, felt one way or the other on it. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Fitzpatrick, being from Merrimack College, <laughs> I hope you're going to support the hockey team. <laughs> Absolutely. At, at Bowen High School. Go Hockey East. Thank yep. you very much. That's my only question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll turn it over to you, Chris. Does the board have any, any questions? Uh, just one for me uh, is it's a course of temporary appointment uh, and then the election cycle will happen in May is it your intention to seek uh, election for the position as well um, at the conclusion of the temporary term here uh, I definitely have the best intentions I think that this actually was a great opportunity in terms of filling an interim position as I do have four children and um, my husband works full-time and I work full-time I felt like this was a good opportunity to kind of get my feet wet and see if I can actually make that commitment in terms of the meetings and the research and the advocacy and promoting of all the agendas that we want to get done I wouldn't want to take up a spot unless I could actually give it my all so I feel like this is a good way to you know get that established and then but I do have you know the best intentions of of doing that yes Uh, with four children in, in in our school system, what would you say has been the greatest impact on their successes in our, in our district so far? Um, I I have had nothing but positive experiences in Bourne Public Schools, so I definitely feel with four very different learners, including two in special education that were on IEPs, uh, and I make that note because my son uh, got off of his IEP in fifth grade and is doing very well despite you know the lack of services support that he gets now that he's so self-sufficient that he does it on his own uh, but I definitely feel that it was the combined effort of both uh, his parents and working with the school that promoted all of their uh, capabilities to the maximum because I will say that all four of my children are very successful in Bourne public schools they're all thriving and doing very well but it was definitely a partnership. Yeah, well, I just want to make a quick comment that I think um, Erica would be the first board member in my recent history that uh, has children in all of the schools at the same time, <laughs> <laughs> which is very actually quite helpful. It really is. And I know that and I do appreciate your honesty and, un and understanding that this is a very dynamic and, and active board and has a variety of different meetings and and yes there's some uh, some commitments that need to be made but we'll certainly work around the schedule we can thank you so, yeah thanks. I don't have one of Peebles although I did have children that went to Peebles so not all four but <laughs> good. Good. and I do I definitely have a, um, a a good working relationship with all four principals my daughter's only a freshman so I don't know Amy as well as I know the other ones but Janie and Melissa and um, Ms. Carpinito, Liz, you know, I definitely appreciate their input and value it and, you know, have no problems uh, coming to them with comments or suggestions or problem solving. They're all, you know, a fabulous team. Thank you, America. Thank you. Okay. If there, oh, Peter, another question? No, no. Oh, we all set, gentlemen? I think we're all set, Chris. I make a nomination. Uh, Thank for uh, Erica Fitzpatrick uh, to serve in the interim term, the remaining term, uh, as the um, on the school committee. Second. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Uh, do you want to go first, or do you want us to do it? We'll go around the room. All right. Mr. Meyer. Yes. Yes. Mr. Mr. Mealy votes yes. 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 Unanimous vote. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Erica, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there's no further business coming before 
the joint. Committees. We have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. much. Appreciate your time. <laughs> Matt. Okay, the next item on the agenda this evening for the Board of Selectmen is the public comment. Jim, is there any public comment for the evening? Uh, there's one note on Mr. Chairman. Can I over? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Kellen Gilbides. She here this evening? Yes. Hi, Karen. Welcome. I've come to ask some questions about future generation wind. And I've been trying to follow the public process um, regarding uh, the complaint that is listed in Barnstable Superior Court. And I can't find any evidence of a hearing date for a preliminary injunction hearing, ex parte or otherwise. And I'd like to know if any hearings are scheduled or have they been held? And if so, what are the results of the hearing? And I also can't find any evidence of the complaint having been served to Future Generation Wind. So I'd like to know when it was served. And um, I also have a question about the non-compliance enforcement orders that Attorney Troy notified the Board of Health needed to be filed prior to any other legal action taking place. And I know we spoke about, or I spoke about this before to you, and I know the Board of Health um, at their meeting, I think it was in the early part of January, uh, created the uh, paperwork to file for the noncompliance orders. However, it looks like they weren't ever served, and I want to know why they weren't served, and will they be served? Um, and why is it that the town attorney said that those had to be done before anything else could be done, and yet there's no evidence of those orders having been served? Um, and I know that you just had executive session, and I also would like to understand why it is that the selectmen meet with the Board of Health and the attorney as opposed to the Board of Health meeting with the attorney to uh, continue with litigation. You're, we're not allowed under public comment to debate. I can provide you a little bit of information. I believe the serve, the uh, documents were served Friday. Is that correct? I believe so. Yeah. Yes. They were served Friday. This fr this past this Friday. This past Friday. And, and I can't comment on anything else that you've asked for. And why is that? Because uh, we're in the middle of litigation. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ellis. Can I ask, uh, are you an attorney? No. No? Okay. Thank you. Um, my understanding is that executive session is executive in regard to the strategy of litigation. And most of this is should be public record that I'm asking about, so I'm not so sure that I, I shouldn't I be able to get I'd an answer. I'd be very happy to find out because I, I don't know at this time many of the questions you asked about the public information relative to where they are, what the schedule is. I do not believe because they were just served that there has been a hearing at this time. I can find out if it's on the docket yet. I don't know if you're aware, but we could not expedite that because of the request, what the request was legally. You cannot expedite that particular request through the court system. Right. But I can certainly find out and provide the information to you, um, and I will talk with either the town administrator or town council to see that that information gets to you, where the schedule is and so forth. Well, and that's a, that is another big question. I know I've, I've met with Mr. Greeno. I've tried to meet with Terry Greeno to, to try to get answers to questions, and it's, it's difficult because I feel like it would be nice to be able to get answers without having to come to the selectmen's meeting and to ask questions. I'll see if we and can do something to help you with that. There doesn't really seem to be a contact person that understands it enough to then explain it to me. Um, I asked multiple times about no hearing date being requested and I really couldn't get an answer and I'm still not sure that I'm not convinced that I've got an answer yet which if, if you would be 
kind enough to write down the questions you have and send them to me. I'll make sure that we put the answers that we can together for you. Anything public would be obviously able then to be passed on to other residents as well. Okay. I'm not trying to dodge your questions or anything. I just don't want to cross lines that I'm not aware of right now. And can you tell me why the selectmen? Yes. Um, the Board of Selectmen are responsible to the town and, and to you as residents on the expenditure of the funds relative to any and all litigation before the town. The executive session held this evening was to bring both boards, both the Board of Health and the Board of Selectmen up to date on where we are with the court case before the town and with future generations. <coughs> so you're responsible for making decisions about the funds? If We're responsible used. for deciding whether or not the town should go forward or not with any decision relative to any action by town council on behalf of the town for all. But I thought that decision was already made. That this is where we start getting close to other lines that I'm not sure about. There are many decisions that have to be made during the court, the context of this court case, because things change. So there was more information that was brought before both boards this evening. We wanted the Board of Health here to ask their advice because it is more to their context of what they're planning to do with their board relative to the next action to be taken. But the responsibility of what action should be taken on behalf of the, of the, behalf of the town rely on this board. Okay, and I, and I can see that. I'm not trying and, to dodge you. I, I'm just I trying to make sure I... had this conversation with Mr. Greeno that, you know, that... I feel strongly that the selectmen are doing their job, and so is Attorney Troy, but I feel like you're protecting the town and not the residents, and that the fact that there's such a question there as to how to proceed and when they can proceed is concerning to me because so much time has now gone by that the only thing we have left now are three blades, and those towers will be complete and most likely spinning before anything legal goes into effect. Typically, there should have been a hearing within 10 days. There was no hearing. There was no request for a hearing that I can find. There was no hearing date set. There was no date requested in any of the complaint. And the enforcement orders that were insisted upon have never been served. So it's confusing to me. And I, I don't I, know I enough about the law. That. What I'm learning, I'm learning from the courthouse and the clerks and from reading because this is new to me, but the fact that I'm figuring this out and we still haven't gotten to that point as a town is very concerning. I don't, I don't feel like I'm in good hands at this point. And that's a problem. And I think that the fact that the selectmen feel the need to intervene, I feel like you're protecting the purse strings of the, of the town and not necessarily the residents. And we, although there is a, a definite connection, um, I it's- can, I can assure you that this board has not voted to withhold any expenses relative to any action to the request of the Board of Health or the Town Council at this time, none. Okay, so do we have um, an expected date of response now from I would like to generation? rather have you ask open-ended questions. I would rather, if you would, to, to write down the questions that you have, including many of what you asked this evening, and I'll try to get as many answers as I can for you. Okay. And those will be answers which can be shared with the public. Okay. Thank you. I, I, on behalf of the board and the town, I apologize for the way this has to be handled. Gentlemen, the next item on the agenda is the minutes from January 12th, 2016. Uh, you might take a look at those. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, review the minutes of January 12th. Um, I would move approval based on the presented minutes. I did not note any corrections or additions. Second. Second. I've got a motion that's been made and seconded to approve the minutes of February, uh, January, February, sorry, that, January the 12th, 2016. Is there any further comments on that motion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, I also note that the chairman abstains from that vote. Right. Regarding the minutes of the 26th. And for the 26th, Mr. Chairman, you were present, so you don't need to abstain this time. I would move approval based upon the presented minutes, as I did not observe anything that required a uh, correction. Second. Motion is made and seconded to approve the minutes of January the 26th. Is there any comments on that motion? It's been made and seconded. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? 
Motion carries unanimously. Just a question regarding the minutes, Mr. If I could, Mr. Chairman. Please. Uh, I'm wondering if we're going to, when we will see some executive session minutes for last yeah, year. Yeah, I could echo that also. Yeah. We're we need to get some before you, and we will do that in the next meeting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Blend, if you'd bring us through item 7, the correspondence for the board this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will try to do so in an expeditious manner, although we are um, blessed to have <laughs> almost 20 <laughs> items of correspondence, and so uh, in... Uh, in, a, in an expeditious manner, I'm just going to actually go through the listing with um, not nearly as much detail as to which you've become accustomed in the past. So number one, is, or letter A rather, school committee agenda for the joint meeting with the Board of Selectmen. We just actually heard this about 15 minutes ago. There's also B, letter of interest from, I apologize for the name pronunciation, Paul Zved of Wiano Road, who would like to serve on the Conservation Commission. Item C, we have a letter of interest from Catherine Kiritsis from Bella Vista Drive, who would like to serve on the Recycling Committee. We also have item D, Molly Mahoney, who submitted a letter of resignation from the Energy Advisory Committee. Item E is a Cape Cod Commission hearing notice, and it is for a March the 2nd, 2016 hearing for Canal Community Solar, which will be a 20.6 acre photovoltaic facility on Tupper Road in Sandwich and the, sir, the hearing will be heard at the Human Services Building on Quaker Meeting House Road on March 2nd. There's item F, an Upper Cape Cod Regional Technical School. They submitted their operating budget for FY 2017 for our review. Item G, we have the Buzzards Bay Coalition, a notice from them that, to let us know they'll be displaying a flag of 12 towns and is requesting permission from the Board of Selectmen to display the Bourne's flag with this viewing. You'll see that in your packet. Item H, there's a letter from EMS of New England, and it's regarding a notice of availability of the ROS INM report, which is the Remedy Operations Status Inspection and Monitoring Report. Lengthy volume in here. Item E, the DEP is upholding the often before us Harbor Master's denial of Peters Marine LLC. Item J, there's a letter from Mr. Ron Matheson of Buzzards Bay, and it is with regard to the very same wind turbines we talked about during public comment, and he is echoing his concern about the direction the Town Board of Selectmen is taking with regard to those turbines. Item K, letter from the Bourne Fire Department that, as of July 1st, 2016, the Bourne Fire Rescue and Emergency Services will no longer monitor or maintain the Kingfisher Fire Alarm Radio Box system. Item L, there's a letter from the Bourne Society for Historic Preservation to encourage an effort to save the stone signage and any of the old buildings that are being demolished in Buzzards Bay. Item M, Cape Light Compact, their activity report is here for October 2015 and November 2015. You'll see those included here. There's item N, the Buzzards Bay Action Committee, their annual assessment, another lengthy report in here for your perusal. Item O, there's the Sealer of Weights and Measures submitted their annual 2015 report for the Town of Bourne. The copies of the report is on file with the Town Administrator's Office for anyone who would like to see that. And lastly, item P, uh, there's a Bourne's Pond Inlet widening. There's a notice of project change, and there's also a copy of that report on file in the Town Administrator's Office. And that, Mr. Chairman, concludes the correspondence. Thank you very much, Mr. Bourne. Is there any questions, Don? Uh, just for good, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've mentioned this a couple of times over the last couple of years, but it does not seem to go anywhere. Um, so I might as well just beat a dead horse again. The seal of weights and measures, as I understand it, are, and as by the letterhead, are the town of Barnstable. For the total year of uh, 2015, that's the calendar year, not the fiscal year, the total amount of fees collected from the entities, the business entities, was 27826 total amount of fines was $8,600. I'm presuming that the fines go to the town of Barnstable as Correct. well. Um, I would like to see the boards look for other alternatives for this. If we use another town, another vendor, uh, and I mean, I, I'm not sure if the fees are set by CMR or state law but while the town does not pay the fees or pay the fines, uh, 
it comes out of our businesses and i'd like to see our businesses be you know given the best opportunity to make their corrections and not be uh, paying a large number of fines or fee uh, fees as well so i'd like to see if we can get another quote on this or two but i, I know it's Maybe we could have an agenda item for that in the future. What if we found out first some information from the board? I mean, I'm not opposing mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. agenda item, but if the fees are set by state statute and the, so are the fines, mm -hmm. then it's a pass through. Right. So well, let's find out some background. Right. I agree with you. Any other comments by any other member of the board? I don't want to speak for everyone. Item number F, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, um, which is the Upper Cape Tax School. I gave you a more detailed description of that instead of the one page that's in your packet. Michael and I with Tom Garino went to the meeting a few weeks ago and so we gave so in your packet tonight I left you the more detailed version of that budget to help you understand what's going on with the Upper Cape Tech budget for this season for FY17. Thank you. Any other questions or comments about any of the uh, correspondence for this week? Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Glenn. You're welcome, Chairman. Now, item A is to, uh, to review and sign a PNS agreement pursuant to Article 9 of the February 16th, 2016 Special Town Meeting. This was the purchase of the land just to the south of the uh, town's landfill operations. As Council uh, discussed with the Board earlier, um, that PNS is currently on its way to the other party for its review and signature while the town posts the notice as required in the central register. Okay, so we'll put that on the future agenda. Correct. Thank you very much. Mr. Garino. Okay, that brings us up to the Cape Light Compact. Oops. Certainly, Karen. You want to come up to the mic just so everybody at home can hear us? The Purchase and Sales Agreement. Who drafts that? The PNS was drafted by town council. And you don't have to have a meeting to uh, and and a vote to have town council um, affect that legal decision. That was taken, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Sure. At the annual at the special town meeting, the article was cleared to have um, a purchase to have the town purchase and have the board of selectmen do what was deemed in the best interest of the town to move that forward the evening of town of the town meeting when the board of selectmen was in session um, the directive was for council to prepare that PNS pursuant to the positive vote the vote by the people or the board by the, town by meeting. the people, by the people town meeting. okay but doesn't the board have to have a meeting and vote to do that as well well that's what tonight's meeting was about? the agenda item for this evening was to finalize and sign that but since it's not available to us this evening we're going to put it on a future agenda we have to okay, but you had a meeting with with town council and it wasn't a public meeting I'm not sure why there was a if I may mr. chairman certainly there was a um, there was probably one or two executive sessions relevant to the discussion of the negotiations and then there was a vote I believe by the board to approve the the, the 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 amount set by the negotiations and then there was the uh, pre-town meeting which was public well actually there was a meeting of the board where the board voted to support article I believe it was nine eight or nine nine, was nine. nine that was the, the meeting department. of the 26th right on the 26th and then there was another meeting which is a pre-town meeting which the town moderator the members of the board of selectmen the members of the finance committee any applicable department heads from planning zoning whatever uh, met it which is a public meeting and was posted appropriately to go over the the the, the vote so there was at least two public meetings relevant to this purchase the negotiations because it would have the negotiations might have a okay. adverse effect on the town's bargaining position were held in executive session and the 
uh, board uh, voted to approve after the negotiations were completed. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Item 10, oh, I'm sorry. You, I, you know what, I've got, again, I've got a different agenda. I wonder if I might just interrupt. Um, we have our representative, uh, state representative. This is the wrong presentation, so Representative Vieira is before me. Yes. Anyway, so I'll perfect timing. <laughs> Excellent, there we go. Welcome, Representative Vieira. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. Thank you to the board. Uh, good to be back, making the loops around. I was in Falmouth Board of Selectmen last night. I'd be over in Mashpee uh, next week. Just giving some updates on project specifics to, to the community, uh, talking a little bit about where we are with the state budget process, and then uh, open for any uh, questions or direction that the board would like uh, the delegation to take. And when I say the delegation, as you know, Representative Hunt uh, and, represent, and State Senator DiMacito also represent portions of the town of Bourne. Uh, so m most of the projects that I'm going to talk about tonight uh, are projects that we have all worked on together. Uh, and then there's some s smaller specific projects um, that I've been working on. But I'm sure the board has uh, been privy to seeing the budgeted cherry sheets that are coming out based on House 2. Um, there's some good news, um, but I'd like to see a little better news uh, when we talk about state-owned property. Uh, the issues around those reimbursements, the cherry sheet shows that those numbers didn't increase. We did see an increase in Chapter 70 for the schools. We saw an increase in the unrestricted government aid, um, but we did not see um, uh, an increase uh, in the state-owned land pilot payment. So uh, we will advocate for that line item um, because it is distributed by formulas. Um, so we're trying to get that pool uh, enlarged during the budget process so that uh, we can get some specific returns here, here in the town of Bourne. Uh, along with that comes the every year discussion of the military impact aid. Uh, this afternoon I met with Chairman Dempsey uh, to have a conversation about that. Uh, we had a joint meeting with Bedford and Bourne officials last year looking at uh, the forward funding of that and the statutory changes that we made uh, two years ago which said that uh, a 1.3 million dollar base of military impact aid would appear uh, by statute in each of the budgets uh, going forward. Uh, the statute doesn't say which budget, it just says in the budget. And so the ability to have the legal recourse to have the aid there uh, is in statute. Uh, the first version, House 2, by the governor did not include that. We had uh, circled back with the administration and said, uh, what's the deal? Well, how come you're not with this anymore? And they said, no, it's not that we're not with it. It's This is a legislative requirement that was placed in statute. And so we want the legislature to put it in there, and the governor fully intends to sign uh, the impact aid when it gets there. So um, the chairman, uh, Dempsey, and I met this morning talking about uh, including that in the House version of the budget. Uh, and we've been working with Senator DiMacito to make sure that it's in the Senate version as well. Um, so uh, we're confident, as it has happened every year, we've gotten it in there. Uh, it's just sort of this who puts it in <laughs> uh, story that changes each year depending on who's where. So um, so I, as a community, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, but we will advocate, as I said, for pilot uh, increase funding. Commuter rail. Everybody's talking about that. Your cherry sheet shows that you now have your MBTA assessment. And the Boston newspaper a couple of weeks ago said, hey, there's no train, but there's an assessment. Well, the assessment's in fiscal 17. Uh, and the goal is to have the pilot program running in fiscal 17. Uh, and with that, this afternoon, Frank DiPaolo confirmed a date uh, with us that we will be meeting on March 8th, uh, the group that met in October. So, uh, Mr. Mailey, we sent you an invitation today as well as um, uh, representatives from the town of uh, Wareham to meet with Astrid Glenn, who's the Deputy Rail Administrator, uh, and Frank DiPaolo, who's the General Manager of the MBTA, to look at the product of our last meeting, which is a uh, pilot service proposal. Uh, and we, once we know the details of that, we'll come back <coughs> to the town of Bourne, and we can either present it uh, in forums like the Selectman's meeting and the Transportation Advisory Committee meeting, or uh, preferably, I think it would be nice to have one large community meeting so we can get community input at the same time. So we'll discuss uh, what's the best venue once we know the details of the plan. But March 8th, uh, they'll be giving us the pilot proposal plan that they've been working on since October. Uh, I swim, uh, we've got that anaerobic digester coming out there. We're looking to get the affluent tapped into the uh, wastewater uh, treatment facility uh, from Joint Base Cape Cod. The problem is we've got about 50 feet of conservation Article 97 land under the Division of uh, Fish and Game jurisdiction, and so you can't get there from here. 
So we had a meeting with uh, attorneys from the Division of Fish and Game along with Commissioner Peterson uh, a couple of weeks ago. We had uh, Town Manager Garino was there as well as uh, Dan Barrett and we are going to be working on drafting, pre-drafting legislation that we know uh, meets the Article 97 standard um, and then the question uh, is about the uh, no, let, no net loss policy. Um, and I don't know if, the, has the board taken any action? On no, that what it's going to happen is that the uh, working group for the landfill is going to be updated by Mr. Barrett on that on Thursday. And then uh, based on the action of that group, it'll come before the board of selectmen at, at that point. So uh, the conservation commission is, uh, Brendan Mullaney has been working on this as well. Um, and so they we're trying to get us, I don't want to use the word synergy, but we're trying to get all of the pieces put together and then bring it before the selectmen in a full package. Great. Uh, what, what I was most impressed of is that when we went with this issue to the commissioner and, and explained what we wanted to do, they actually came to us with uh, some steps on how to get there rather than saying, well, you give us a proposal and we'll review it. They actually came, uh, which I think was a nice compromise as far as the no net loss policy is to take existing conservation land uh, in just Article 97. 97 and then so there's no you there would be no um, financial compensation for any land swaps or purchases and then it takes a two-thirds roll call in the house and senate which we, we won't have a problem with once we get the the correct language legislation a couple of things happened uh this uh, fall we had the first uh seaport economic council chaired by lieutenant governor Polito, hosted uh, right here in the town of Bourne, over at the mass maritime academy uh, and the other exciting part of that meeting was the first round of grants uh, included a grant for the uh, tidal test site at the railroad bridge by the marine um, renewable energy um, uh, collaborative uh, they they're working with the town I know they've asked for some uh, office space for some interns that are doing work on permitting and we're, they're going to be able to uh, utilize some space here without having a footprint that stays so it'll just be the days that they have to have a, a place near the site to work on it um, so there's a good partnership going on with the town and the permitting uh, is in process with the Army Corps of Engineers uh, to get uh, to get the site up and running um, at the, the meeting this morning uh, in Gloucester, Captain Bushy was there, uh, and by unanimous vote, the Seaport Economic Council appropriated $1 million for the pier expansion at the Mass Maritime Academy. So that pier expansion will not only be able to be used by the Academy, but it will also be able to be used by um, other public safety and law enforcement marine-based services, um, and it will also be able to play into this hydrokinetic um, educational program. So we've got a pier. And we had an appropriation for a turbine uh, at the pier. But when we went to bid, when Mass Maritime went to bid, the earmark uh, limitation of $100,000 did not meet the lowest bid that came in. Uh, and so the question was, how do we buy the turbine? There was a $1 million total appropriation between three institutions. It was between Mass Maritime, uh, Bristol Community College, and UMass Dartmouth. And so by an interagency partnership of the three uh, institutions, uh, they found out how to carve up their budget to allow a $250,000 purchase for a turbine, which was the low bidder. Um, and then the question was, did we need legislative change? So we met with uh, Administration and Finance Secretariat, and we were able to get authorization uh, from the administration since we didn't change the total number. We weren't asking for more money. We were just looking for money within the appropriation to be distributed differently. Uh, and all of the parties that were subject to that, the three uh, institutions, were in agreement. So uh, Captain Bush. She, uh, the day that he was uh, boarding the vessel to go to sea, uh, got the approval to move forward with the purchase of the turbine. So we worked that problem <coughs> out. I'll stay on marine-based services, I guess, uh, while I'm at it. Uh, Cohasset Narrows. It, it's almost taken as long as it took to build a bridge to get the sand out of the slips uh, over at D'Angelo's and the Lanahan's property. Uh, but I'm proud to say that uh, as of this week, the contractor has been retained to fix the problem. The uh, time of year exemption has been issued. And now the final step is the Army Corps of Engineers permit. They've asked the contractor to pre-stage, so you might see equipment if it's not down there yet on its way down there. Um, and we'll clean up those slips so that come summer season, there won't be any impact on those businesses. Mr. Chairman, if I could just chime in and, and thank the representative. He has been absolutely on this for well over a year now, it seems. I told them I would put um, my diving glasses on and go underwater with a GoPro to prove that there's no winter flounder this week so they could do the dredging. Uh, and they said, Rep, you don't have to do that, Will. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's been a lot of work, and it's appreciated. I know by uh, the folks down there, certainly the Lenihans are appreciative, as is Mr. Mullen um, at, at the DNR. So that's been a lot of work. Thank you. 
no problem. Andrew Campbell, uh, the former superintendent of the uh, of the Warren Water District, um, has finally made his appointment uh, to the Community Advisory Council out uh, at Joint Base Cape Cod. Uh, there was an administrative uh, handover there. His application had been submitted b uh, before Governor Baker took office, and not all of the applications for open slots had been transferred. So we were waiting to hear back. When we inquired, we found out that there was no application of, of record. Um, so he had to reapply, um, and we worked with the governor's office to get that done, and uh, he got his appointment uh, about a month or two ago. Uh, some small things. Scott Fitzmorris, I know, had sent an uh, email to some of the selectmen about the county hospital sign down at the Five Corners. And I always drove by there and thought, gee, you know, it must be somebody like Jerry Ellis, you know, a historian that doesn't want to take that sign down. But it seemed odd that it was there, but nobody ever said anything to me, so, you know not my backyard I wasn't going to go take a sign down until I saw this email and I said well what's the problem oh we contacted and they, so I called our, our folks that we work with at, at MassDOT on a Friday and on a Tuesday they took the sign down so um, didn't realize that there was a desire to take it down until that email came across our desk Mr. Ellis had been working hard to get that sign down we had a well, hope for a really big snowstorm this winter where they were, were, were <laughs> in fact where a truck would sort of that veer that off the happened, road a little but, um, I, I picked up the nickname Don Quixote yeah <laughs> <laughs> so well we uh, we took care of that one the other email that came across uh, your desk recently uh, was from John Spears relative to streetlights at the at the Bourne Rotary uh, MassDOT said it wasn't their responsibility through his negotiations and Eversource says it wasn't their responsibility and Siemens said it wasn't their responsibility so again we called our folks at MassDOT who said it's Eversource I called the Eversource Vice President of Government Affairs uh, and in the next couple of weeks the streetlights the 10 streetlights will be replaced so took care of that one Bassett Island Water Project, uh, the main is out there. Uh, that was a special petition that you all sent to the legislature um, so that we could run a water main uh, under the public ways. Again, that was uh, dealing with some Article 97 issues. Uh, we were able to expedite the legislative process, uh, get it signed, <coughs> and uh, the main is out there and the houses will be hooked up um, in the spring. They just didn't get the actual house hookups done yet. The main's completed. Um, my work on the Military Asset Security Strategy Task Force, um, we are going to host, Congressman Keating and I, a joint base Cape Cod uh, Business Industry Day for local businesses in southeastern Massachusetts, whether they provide uh, services or products, uh, to learn about the contracting uh, procedures both with the Department of Homeland Security Coast Guard and also the Department of Defense for the other units that are out there. And that will be on March 28th um, from 8.30 to 11.30. We'll have some publicity on this. Uh, and it'll be at the Barnstable Municipal Airport, actually. Uh, I wanted to try to do it on the base, but with all the issues of folks getting out there and getting the clearance list, we didn't want uh, somebody to miss the opportunity because they didn't get on the right list and got stuck at the gate. So uh, we had an offer for some for free space at the Retric Center. Um, so the Military Asset Security Strategy Task Force, Congressman Keating and I will host that event uh, on March, March 28th. Uh, and the, the last little thing, I, I had an opportunity to, uh, to meet with some folks a couple of weeks ago, Nathan Robinson uh, and John Carroll, uh, who's on the Transportation Advisory Committee relative to uh, this concept of a Bourne Rail Trail connecting um, the existing rail corridor to this uh, Shining Sea Bikeway in Falmouth. Um, and had, we had an opportunity to talk to John, uh, to um, Glenn Cannon from the Cape Cod Commission. They actually have some funding available that could do a feasibility study to look at if you were to use dual use to, to be able to leave the rails there and have some type of access, um, if you were to do a replacement or leaving it alone. Um, and so a formal request needs to come from an entity within the municipality. Uh, and uh, Chair Oliva of the uh, Transportation Advisory Committee is uh, preparing to host a meeting uh, to bring that as an agenda topic uh, to see if the Advisory Committee would like to request uh, the feasibility study. And then from there, we kind of decide what, what the idea is. But he's got a great, uh, they've got a great uh, website with a, a little video they just did about the potential uh, of what could happen in that corridor. So I think it's good for us to uh, open up and explore all the options possible. So anything we can do to keep that project moving forward. And lastly, you'll notice tomorrow there's a new uh, American flag uh, as you enter town through Cahasset Narrows by the uh, Visitor Center. Uh, Marie uh, Oliver and her staff and I uh, put that flag up uh, this afternoon. There was a flag there that had been there for quite some time. It had good use. It was tattered. I had a meeting there last week and saw it, and so we uh, went to a local vendor uh, actually in town of Mashpee and purchased a new flag, and we uh, raised it today. So proud to have a, a good... Uh, Good American flag. I was the Eagle Scout in me got out when I saw it. I said, <laughs> we got to replace that. I'll be back next week with a new flag. So, <laughs> so those are some of the things that, that we're working on. If uh, the board has any further direction, things that we should or questions. I'll open up uh, uh, Peter and then Don. 
Any word? <clears throat> any word on, on on the tip list for the rotaries coming out? I know for a while there was the one down here by CVS was probably the one that was closest to the top of the list to possibly be removed. And it seems like Mass Dot has a meeting every year to give an update. Um, and the other and the other half of that question is the third bridge proposal, uh, public private proposal. partnership. What is the status of that? Good, good questions. The first one is uh, I'm not sure where the current uh, tip schedule is, but we can find that out uh, and get it to you. Um, the second uh, portion is the P333 Council, uh, the Oversight Council, was the one that was driving uh, the discussion around that uh, with support from MassDOT. Uh, since our joint interventions in the process, I'll, I'll say that, <laughs> uh, the Oversight Commission hasn't had a meeting um, and the project hasn't moved forward. That being said, the overall transportation management uh, process and working group is continuing to meet. Uh, it has got a meeting coming up in a week or two. It's mm -hmm. on my calendar somewhere here. Um, so we will continue to talk about uh, the new uh, data that they have, the traffic counts and studies, um, and the parallel course, the Army Corps of Engineers is continuing uh, with the federal funding that they have of their necessary study, um, which we're probably about a year out to complete. Um, as to whether or not the federal government is going to recommend replacement um, or refurbishing of the existing bridges. Um, and all of the signs uh, right now, the Army Corps folks are telling us, are leading towards replacement. So if the requirement is a replacement by the federal government of the existing bridges, uh, they would have to meet current federal transportation standards, highway standards, and that means uh, wider lanes and um, additional space outside of the lanes and breakdown. Uh, so those issues of slowing down because you can't get here from there and the tight passages and all of that, um, those would be would be dealt with uh, by meeting the current highway standards for bridge construction. So. Thank you. Uh, I met with Mr. Robinson last week, uh, relatives of the rail trail, uh, from a historic point of view and as a s select person to report back to this board, but nothing had happened, so I'm very pleased to hear there is some movement going forward on that. Uh, I personally feel it's uh, well worth the uh, time, effort, and investment to do that. And I appreciate the fact that you're involved in it because at least we'll get it up and going, first class, whatever. And secondly, uh, my, my comment was to be on the third bridge. Uh, frankly, I'm opposed to a third bridge. Uh, but if we can put bridges that twine with the existing bridges, that's fine. Uh, but when you look at how much land is going to be lost, I think the town of Bourne will be in a state of shock if they go in for one bridge. So thank you for your hard work on that. And if you need any support against it, just call me. If it starts up again, we'll definitely uh, come back, circle back to, to all the interested parties. Uh, and it's not just myself, it's the delegation. I did organize the initial meeting um, that we had uh, in Hyannis with the Army Corps of Engineers in MassDOT to say, slow down, stop, what are you doing? And by the end of that meeting, um, they were actually uh, passing out business cards uh, of the engineers that they had on staff in the two different uh, agencies so that they could do peer reviews without having to seek appropriations for the required peer reviews. So there was some synergies there. The entire delegation, Congressman Keating was involved with that as well. Um, and we understand that it is a federal obligation um, and that we want to make sure that uh, any decision uh, that's made is made in a coordinated fashion and we don't have people just building bridges everywhere. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone from the public? <laughs> Please, Paul. Question, that's a good question. I, I actually numbers? saw the application for, um, do I have it in the notice? I actually think it's in the notice that was sent out. I believe it's Middlesex Corporation. Yeah, it's Middlesex Corporation uh, out of Littleton, Massachusetts. Uh, term of work, six weeks, sediment removal by four quadrants. By the four quadrants. Uh, it doesn't say the amount, though. It doesn't say it on here, but it would be in the, in the core permit. So we. Uh, they're going to dredge it out. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Mulvey. Good evening, Representative. You've got a lot on your plate. Of the several things that are <coughs> in the legislature now, uh, the turbines and, of course, the effect it has on juvenile fish is a separate issue I'm sure can be handled. The one that really rings the bell with me at this time is a discussion about the possibility 
of running a pipeline from the sewage plant in Wareham to the railroad bridge that would handle a million gallons of fresh water treated fluent from the Wareham sewage plant and injected into the canal at the railroad bridge. A million gallons of fresh water treated affluent being going in there. Presently, Mass Maritime, and they have what, 1,600 students and that's not staff, all the affluent because of the history they have for a permit, that now goes into the canal at the academy. Now you're talking about another possibly million gallons going into the canal. You also, by infiltration, you have the military installation, the Coast Guard, the Air, then the National Guard. That all goes to their treatment plant and is infiltrated on the hilltop over the canal. Whatever goes in there on a day's output, and that's a big installation, necessarily hydrologically ends up in the canal. Otherwise, they would flood their infiltration. So now you have the total mass maritime going in, a proposed million a day from the Wareham sewage plant, and you also have numerous four-foot cast iron pipes draining all the state highway catch basins, catching all the runoff from the roadways going into the canal. <clears throat> of course, what I fear, to put it bluntly, is turning the canal into a, an open sewer. Now, I understand the um, possibilities here of uh, growth and so on and so forth, but I do have and take exception to the proposal to bring that much say fresh water into a marine environment carrying all the pharmaceuticals that are not filtered out in treatment, all the heavy metals that are not filtered out, and in a canal that does not constantly flow in one direction, but at one point it lies dormant, and if this is continually going in, it's forming a bubble that when it moves is going to move and then come back and get another shot. I have some very, very serious doubts about that and the effect, say, on also Sandwich and the other end of the canal. They've involved two towns in that. So that much treated fresh water in a marine environment carrying all the byproducts that are not filtered out in treatment going into a, one location, I'm deeply concerned about that and eventually that is going to be an item. Uh, that I believe is going to heavily involve not only the county but the state. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ellis. Yep. If I could uh, respond to one of the comments that Mr. Mulvey made relative to the filter beds at Joint Base Cape Cod, uh, which is up near the uh, transmission lines uh, in Bourndale. Uh, on a previous committee that I was on, there was a study done uh, before we ever approve that and uh, because of its height in the area involved uh, that it isn't but it comes quite to portable water by the time it gets to the canal because it filters down it takes I believe I could stand to be corrected but I believe uh, the system uh, took uh, from three to four months just to make its way to the canal so there is a study that exists on that Mr. Mulvey, I'd ask in your, your appreciation for our time this evening. This is not an agenda Absolutely. item. Uh, just a one comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, treat, Mr. the treatment plants today are not what they call tertiary, where it comes out as drinking water. It does not take out the hormones, the pharmaceuticals, and the heavy metals. It is not drinking water quality. Not only that, but it is fresh water going into a marine environment, and uh, marine animals don't tolerate that well. <coughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Other questions or comments for a representative? I do have a comment, here? but I won't make it right now. <laughs> <coughs> Anything else, gentlemen? Anything else from the public? Representative, thank you very much for your time thank this you. evening thank you. and coming out. <coughs> okay. I now have the correct agenda in front of me. <laughs> uh, I would like to welcome the Cape, Log Co Cape Light Compact before us this evening to update and provide a presentation to us on the next energy efficiency plan and smart grid. <laughs> need to introduce Maggie. I'm going to have to ask you to come up to a mic. Times, but, uh, 
Any mic. <laughs> it's always my. <clears throat> it's always my pleasure, Bob Schofield, a Cape Light Compact from Bourne, uh, to introduce Maggie Downey, who is untirelessly in how she runs the Cape Light Compact and has for the last 18 years, and she has a. A great presentation for all of us tonight and we're very excited about where we're going for the next three years to help all of us. Maggie do you want me to flip the... No I'm going to do it. Okay. Thank you very much Bob. Maggie welcome. Thank it's you. Good nice evening. To see you. Um, I'm excited to be here. I am also making my rounds to each of the member towns on the Cape and Vineyard and I'm excited to be here in Bourne. Um, Bob's going to get to the next slide. And I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about our power supply program uh, and energy efficiency, the new three-year energy efficiency plan, and then introduce a uh, topic, grid modernization, that will hopefully be the beginning of several conversations <coughs> with um, interested members from the town of Bourne. And I want to be respectful of your time, so I'll go through this um, at a good clip. And if you have any questions at any time, please don't, you know, if you feel free to stop me if I'm on a slide that you want to talk about, or I'll defer to the chair on how you want to handle um, questions. So um, the Cape Light Compact, as you may recall, is an intergovernmental organization made up of the 21 towns. It's the 15 towns on the Cape, the six towns on the Vineyard, as well as the two counties. And we were created, basically the Cape Light Compact is the town of Bourne. The town of Bourne is the Cape Light Compact. Um, we are a creature of the Massachusetts legislature as a result of the 1997 Restructuring Act. And we have three primary goals. One, to administer locally the energy efficiency programs on the Cape and Vineyard to offer an opt-out power supply program and advocate for consumers. And like Bob introduced me, I just want to say Bob has been involved with the Cape Light Compact programs for over 15 years. He's participated in all of my power supply negotiations and does a great job representing the town and brings a wealth of business experience um, and lots of contract negotiations to the, the Cape Light Compact team. So we're very appreciative of his time um, and he gives a lot of it to the Cape Light Compact. Now Next. <coughs> so just briefly on our power supply um, program, this year we opted in for on the residential side to do a 12 month rate. So our rates are on our website, it's a 9.6 cent rate. Our commercial, small commercial rate is 10.9 cents and then our industrial rate is 10.6 rate. So on the slide you can see um, this is a significant reduction for, for us as well as all suppliers serving the Southeast Massachusetts region compared to the big price in, uh, increases last year. So you should, residential customers should see about a $33, almost a $34 decrease in their electric bill over last year. Um, and if you're a large user using over 1,000 kilowatts, you'll see almost a 60 or $58 reduction in your electric bills. Again, that's because of the economics, what's driving and making up prices between um, the natural gas spikes from last year and, and this year. And this is not just a Cape Lake Compact. It's indicative of any competitive supplier. If I might interrupt, Maggie, I think the handouts that we received are not the same as the ones. If you have those, oh, that you would help us to go along. I, I knew you did. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt. So on our on power supply, just and, and again, just for the audience and those I know I know that you know this, but we have um, restructured electric utility industry in Massachusetts. So what does that mean? The utilities deregulated in 1997, so customers can choose their supplier. The Cape Light Compact was authorized by town meeting to provide an option for consumers. So um, and what we've uh, discovered over the last several years is this is not something that consumers find easy. It's confusing and frankly, some are just not even interested in participating in competitive markets. So in response to the questions that we get all the time, we put on our website some helpful information. So this is just a snapshot that I took off the website that shows uh, how do you read your electric bill, um, what's on the electric bill. So we, we think we, we ran it by the governing board, looked at it, staff looked at it. We think it's pretty simple. Follow the ABCs on your left that explains what makes up your bill, the components of electric bill. And then on the right, uh, on our website, we also put out information on how to check, uh, select a supplier. We recognize that the Cape Light Compact isn't the only competitive 
supplier um, and it might not be the best one for you as a resident or a business. So um, we put together some f uh, facts, information, things that you should be looking for. We encourage <coughs> people to participate in competitive markets, but like anything, you have to be a smart shopper. You have to know the right questions, you have to um, and, and ask questions and get information. So we have a video on the website as well as just Q&As to help people select competitive suppliers and participate in this in this market. Next. So moving along to my favorite topic is our energy efficiency plan. So the Cape Lake Compact just had our three-year, uh, which is 2016 to 2018 energy efficiency <coughs> plan approved. It was approved by the Department of Public Utilities. It is a $128 million three-year plan. Um, it was We went through a fully adjudicated proceeding in front of the Department of Public Utilities where they looked at all aspects of the plan, everything from how many um, LED light bulbs we're installing in residential homes to what we're proposing to do on our small businesses on the Cape and Vineyard. The DPU evaluated the cost benefits. They asked us questions. This was almost a two month process um, where we went back and forth with the, not only the Department of Public Utilities but the Attorney General's office. And this program changed significantly as a result of the 2008 Green Communities Act. Prior to 2008, we had very small energy efficiency programs. They were only about $5 million annual budgets. Um, we have significantly grown as a result of the ma a mandate by the Massachusetts legislature. And I put the words up there right from the legislation because it, I think it's important to re remind people that we are charged um, as the administrator of this program to pursue all electric and natural resource needs shall first be met through available energy efficiency and demand reduction that are, co that are more cost effective and less expensive than supply. And so basically we are charged by the legislature then rather than because it is more cost effective to conserve energy than to build new power plants or new transmission or distribution systems to pursue energy efficiency and demand response so we were given very aggressive goals and very large budgets over this past year and the next three year energy efficiency plan to achieve um, savings we are one of seven program administrators in the state of Massachusetts that have also been given aggressive goals um, to accomplish this and on the next slide, I can very happy to report that during the last three-year plan, which just ended in 2015, the Cape Light Compact um, exceeded our savings goals by 123%. So if you look all the way over on the right, um, you'll see what our goal was that the DPU set. When I say goal, I'm talking about kilowatt hours saved. How much energy did you save by installing energy efficiency measures in homes and businesses on the Cape and Vineyard? So uh, I'm very, very happy to say um, that our programs are very successful. They're highly su subscribed to. And, a li uh, why, and I believe why that is the case is because of the um, design of our programs, the input from the community, and the board when we are preparing our three-year plan. And on the next slide, I'm going to get into just a little bit a, um, an overview. So we have a residential program, we have a low-income program, and we have a commercial program. Those are three um, mandated sectors that we have to serve. So if you're a, if you own a, a resident, we all own. If you rent, own a home, and you have an electric bill, all of the funds that are paid by the residential bit, uh, electric rate payers stay within that bucket. So there's no cross subsidization. The commercial and industrial programs, the dollars that fund that program, are collected from those customers. The only exception is low income because we're mandated by state law to fund that at 10% of our total budget. So there is a crossover for low income customers. Otherwise, the residential dollars stay with residential programs and so commercial dollars stay with commercial programs. So there's no cross subsidization there beyond um, the low income. So we have programs, uh, residential, and all of this information is on our website. We also include the income thresholds to see what you qualify for for each of the programs. Um, so there's residential, I said, low income and commercial. And on the next slide, I always say this, but it is my favorite slide uh, for the residential program. This is a residential brochure. I included it in the presentation because it really gives a comp it's, it's a home and it gives a comprehensive overview of the types of um, rebates, the types of measures that uh, you as a residential homeowner are available. You are entitled to have an audit every 12 months. 
um, your, these are your dollars, these are your programs. If you haven't had an audit in several years, technologies have changed. It used to be CFLs that were installed. Now we've moved to a different lighting, light LEDs. Um, so the technology is continuously improving. Um, several years ago, we didn't have a heat loan. Just for the audience, does, does the board know what the heat loan program is? No. Um, so know? the heat loan is a zero interest up to seven year loan um, for up to seven year loan for 20 up to twenty five thousand dollars for eligible energy efficiency measures for example you have an energy audit and as part of your energy audit you have identified that you have are in need of you have single pane windows which many of us may do in older homes or you have an inefficient heating system what we did is we take the dollars and buy down the interest rate so it becomes a zero interest loan and you can by going through the audit becomes identified measure and filling out the forms and these are done through conventional bank loans but we're we have worked with several of our cape and vineyard banks so that you have a zero interest loan to implement the most expensive energy efficiency measures because as i'll talk about in another slide uh, the cap on insulation and weatherization is four thousand dollars. You may have a very large home that is going that has has no insulation in it, and it exceeds the four thousand dollar cap. So the heat loan could be used for that. Could be used for a replacement to a high efficiency heating system, or it could be used for replacing. Uh, single pane windows to Energy Star. So again, um, we heard we went through over time after running these programs where the gaps were and what the needs were for not only from the Cape but from all over Massachusetts. So this loan program is offered throughout the state of Massachusetts. It's a highly successful program on the Cape and Vineyard um, and many, many of our homeowners take advantage of it. So again, things change, even though you might have had an audit five or six years ago, if you, I'd encourage you to um, call again. If nothing else, it's a great way to have to affirm that your home is as efficient as it can be. Next, Bob. So one of the things that the board um, determined and what makes the Cape Light Compact different, one of the few things that make us very different from the other program administrator or utilities is we solicited a phenomenal amount of community input. We had a survey, we did over almost 90 community forums to determine what the level of incentives were appropriate. In, elsewhere in the state for uh, insulation and air sealing, you're eligible for 75% up to $2,000. The Cape Light Compact Governing Board changed that several years ago, you know, not because they wanted to be better or offer more incentives, but what was happening is the cost of the insulation um, projects on the Cape and Vineyard exceeded $2,000. So what we found was happening is we were ending up having to go back to the same home over more than one year, which was driving our administration costs up as well. So the board, uh, you know, we looked at the data, we presented it to the board, and the board changed the incentives. We also found a barrier that um, year-round renters who pay their own electric bill couldn't engage their landlords because the landlords had no interest in making the improvements because they didn't pay the bills. So again, the board <laughs> stepped up to the plate and um, changed the incentive. So that, like uh, low to moderate income customers, we increased the incentive to 100% up to $4,000. Again, these were identified as barriers to participation um, and the board discussed them, debated them, sought public input, and then made amendments to the plan that were approved by the Department of Public Utilities. Question? Maggie, on multifamily homes um, that, are, that have one owner, but they have three or four units, if do all four units have to join in on the program? Because insulating one unit, you know, exterior wall one unit doesn't make a lot of sense. So is there, does there have to be a buy-in? By all of the tenants. Um, so, if you'll just look, so multifamily actually is officially determined by five or more um, units. So anything that w below four is a resident is a residential goes to the residential program. So for multifamilies f on the five plus units, what we do um, we actually we just we, the board just piloted this um, in the town of Brewster is we work with the condo association or townhome association to get buy-in and to treat and to treat the entire facility so that the incentive is a hundred percent otherwise we can only touch the property that um, like a homeowner owns but if it is a rental property and the home and the if you won't if it was your five six, six unit condominium complex you could authorize treating the whole facility 
So there are two different dependings. Are they owned by, is the whole property owned by one and no. one person? Then it can be treated as an entire property. We, we will always serve individual units. So if you own, I own the building, but you own a unit and you want to have lighting or um, other measures done, we can do it. For renters, year-round renters, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of someone who lives in a five or six unit apartment right. facility as opposed to owning a condo. They lease, they, they, they have a, if one unit wants to do something in a five or six unit apartment complex, mm -hmm. can they? We can do anything in the unit if we're altering the structure and it's not owned, we need the owner's permission. But then we can treat the facility as a whole or just that unit. But we can't, as a renter, we couldn't insulate or, tr or, or touch the unit other than the inside of the-, the, the inside, right. okay, thank you. So we need the owner's permission for rentals, which is why we changed the incentive, because if they weren't paying the bill, they didn't really, they had no interest in it. And it's still, a, it, you know, renters are still, are hard to reach, hard to serve, especially if it's an absentee, um, property owner, if they don't live on the Cape or Vineyard, or if they don't even live in the state of Massachusetts, trying to get them to sign off on something, even though it's at no cost to them, can still be a challenge. Okay. Thank you. So the next um, business programs. So we, the board and the Cape Lake Compact had approval. We changed our small business program, which are, um, we used to have to go back multiple times to, we have about 17,000 small commercial co accounts. So we modeled and changed the small business program after the successful residential program so that when we go into the, biz the small business, we bring with us when the vendor goes in as many instant measures and do as much work as possible on the single visit as opposed to coming in doing an audit and scheduling multiple visits for installation so we streamline the process um, change the incentive measures all to engage customers we also have a medium we're rolling out the next three-year plan serving by sectors so uh, th this industry has actually vendors that focus on serving hospitals on focus and they have very unique custom measures on grocery stores so this the next three-year plan we will be focusing on lodging specifically on a lot of our small residential B&Bs or small inns and going in with uh, recommended measures that are uniquely designed and tailored toward that sector and then the last is we will be focusing on our large, um, continues to focus on our large customers uh, because they use about, there are less than 100 customers that equate to 70 approximately 70% of our CNI load. So it's just a handful of large customers who use most of the CNI electricity. So we're working with them to develop MOUs so that we can have long term and work with their capital planning so that we can get these um, improvements in at the ground level. Uh, municipalities uh, are approximately 7% of our commercial and industrial um, KWH, uh, not, uh, not accounts, and we offer incentives up to 100% for all cost effective measures. The board is piloting something new this year for nonprofits, um, and it's only for it's a first come first serve for approximately 100 nonprofits, and they broke it out. We're still working on the details with the board, but these would be nonprofits who are serving um, have a, a low income customers that have a budget up to 15 million dollars, and then those nonprofits who have a budget up to two million who are serving social or cultural um, communities on the Cape and Vineyard. And again, trying to get those, what we determined is again, hard to reach, hard to serve. These <coughs> entities didn't have any funding to do co-pays and were not participating because they couldn't come up with matching funds. Um, we say nonprofits. I mean, one thing that comes to mind is the Born Housing Authority. Mm -hmm. um, on the state program, the state has their capital program amortized over five years and you're given an allotment based on how many residents you have, period. And what happened is you can take that money and you can spend it anywhere you like. Now, <coughs> in Bourne, you have Continental Apartments. You have the two off of uh, Waterhouse Road. And, um, you know, for handicap and family, those are your state developments. The state, even under Val Patrick and even before that under uh, Mitt Romney, was notorious for cutting money back, money back to a point now where in order, because we have an economic target zone, we're able to use CPC monies 
for um, Continental Apartments to do some of the emergency upgrades, you mm -hmm. know, the sprinkler system, the electric. But well, my point is, is the housing authorities are getting less and less money, and some of these state properties, the ones off of Waterhouse Road, the handicap development is in disrepair. They have replaced roofs, they have replaced the heating systems over there, but it needs windows, and they'll may need some energy efficiency things, and I'm wondering if there's a way of working with that, you know, with that segment of the population, because you know there are they are there to provide us, you know, f for the service of need for the people who can't afford it. Um, I, Bob and I will follow up on that one because if if the um, units are serving low income and meeting the state guidelines, they're eligible. We access lots of other funding, so again, our dollars are for all energy efficiency measures. So it's um, it's used to maximize and to kind of piggyback on other funding. So Bob and I can fo follow up with the housing authority. Just ask for Barbara Thurston. Uh, what was her name? Barbara Thurston. She's the outgo. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, and also new is we are doing a demand response offering um, in the next three-year plan. So we will be seeking out 200 uh, commercial and residential customers that, and, per, and basically what, what we're trying to, and I'll get into it in another slide, is to see if there are customers who are willing to, when asked upon, reduce their load during peak times, um, which for us is day 4 to 8 p.m. in the summer and uh, what technologies can we bring to the table to um, help facilitate that in, 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 in exchange for an incentive. Lowering peak demand saves all ratepayers because we have to build to the peak and there are some very fascinating technologies out there. So for central AC customers, you know, the last thing anybody, well, I'm not turning, I'm not touching my AC in the middle of the summer. Well, the technologies have evolved, I think it's called Big Bear, where you actually, and I'm not an engineer, where you actually chill the water at night so when you don't when there's not a need for it and then you don't it doesn't change the temperature it's just that the fan is running by over the the um chilled water without using energy during the peak times so there's lots of innovative technologies that are on the market and that continue to improve so that's basically the demand response and uh, national grid and the cape Lake compact are the only two pas who are offering um, a demand response program like this in the next three years and again it's an offering because we're it's a pilot so we're trying to see what level of participation is there an interest and pe did people actually play um, and then the last thing that we're going to tee up um, is a subject matter of grid modernization and on the right um, even though he's in funky color is Elon Musk and on the left is Nikola Tesla and in between is a whole not a whole lot of change in the electric utility industry um, so what is a smart grid uh, or grid modernization? It is all about the increased use of d remote data and two-way power flows. And grid modernization and most of the advances have taken place outside of the ut standard investor-owned utility. They have been entrepreneurial in nature and they have been pushing and driving change inward. So, um, right, wanna go to the next slide? I have a picture. So basically, what on the left you have today's grid. You have your central power plant, and you have large transmissions lines, and then a distribution system going out. It is a one-way power flow. Uh, and what grid modernization is talking about is what is on the right, which is two-way power flow, which is, has um, distributed energy resources located in the community. Energy is going both ways. You have microgrids um, appropriately sited and located. As, and the, again, the intent of grid modernization is in the event that there is an issue, it helps identify the issue quickly, so it's more cost effective to problem solve, and the entire grid doesn't need to go down. You can isolate and problem solve a any issues, and it also comes in the event of an emergency where you can isolate that, such as, they say, the Hyannis area or a hospital that has um, generators as well as storage can in an event of emergency can operate if there was a time when there was no electricity due to a hurricane etc so again i think this is a great graphic it shows you what's potential and possible uh, and the utilities bob if you want to go to the next slide the dpu um department of public utilities told the the utilities that you, you have to file grid modernization plans and the object your plan should be reduce the effective outages, 
optimized demand, and remember I was talking about that, that red line on the chart is our peak demand. We have to build our entire infrastructure to that peak demand so that in the instant where we're using the most electricity in the summer, everything works. And the goal is to flatten that peak demand, thereby saving all customers and all rate payers money. Um, we also have to integrate distributed energy resources. We're talking about what's happening out at um, the canal plant with that solar that you got the announcement on. We're talking about what happens out at the base. So integrating all of this into our infrastructure. And again, the goal is to improve mobile workforce and asset management, because that will also help save costs. So the plans were filed. They were filed in August of 2015. And what, what is shaping up are two very different, and I, and I don't intend to say one is better, one is worse. Then my point is I want to make sure that we understand that they're very different. Um, Eversource is focusing on grid-facing technologies. A lot of um, substation and smarter technologies, it, changing their internal computer systems and how they're um, um, informed of outages. They have a very strong emphasis on reliability. They are not convinced that residential customers and small business customers will benefit from time of use meters or advanced metering. And again, they rightfully point out that 2% of their customers or 80% of their entire CNI usage um, is just, it comes from a very small amount of their customers. So by focusing on a small amount of customers, they can impact a large amount of their electricity. And that is pretty much inside the 128 corridor for Eversource. National Grid has taken a different approach. Uh, they want to be the utility of the, f the future. And they, want, they see customers on their iPhones checking, changing appliances, participating um, in demand response programs. They did a smart pot grid pilot in Worcester for about 15,000 customers involving uh, renewables, time of use meters, and demand response and it was very successful, so they're building off of that. It saved customers, I think they estimated about 23% reduction in their utility bills, and they're also looking at storage as part of a way to address this. Very different costs. One is a $1 billion plan on the right, and the other is, um, I think, about 900, excuse me, <clears throat> about 500 to $900,000 um, in, 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 in costs. So the question that we're teeing up and why we're having um, stakeholders dialogues is what is it that the Cape and Vineyard customers want to see developed and offered? What do they want? Because we will, these will all be rate based. So Bob, you want to go to the next slide for a second? Um, we will pay for all of the infrastructure upgrades uh, as through a grid modernization docket. And the question that the compact has been engaging other stakeholders, such as the Tech Council meeting with the Cape Cod Commission, bringing this to meetings up for boards of selectmen, is what do we want to see happen on the Cape and Vineyard? Um, and do we understand what it means that to have time of use meters? Do we want to have individual customers pay? How do we want to pay for these? Should they be mandatory? Should they be optional? So um, the board has just begun this process uh, to engage not only other towns, but other stakeholders to have a conversation to see if we can put together a platform that we can bring to the Department of Public Utilities saying this is what we would like to see happen on the Cape and Vine Vineyard relative to grid modernization. Just to follow up for that, for the chair. Please, uh, yeah. um, With the advent of hybrid cars more and more now, and especially what Tesla have in their uh, facility over in Sagamore. Uh, do we see the compact providing charging stations or docking stations um, for for hybrid cars? You know that are on vacation that don't you know that won't be able to charge until they get home at all. That's what actually demand. We did have EV charging stations in our plan, and the DPU took it out because they felt it was not an energy efficiency measure. It rightfully belongs in grid modernization, and and yes, we agree. Um, what is the potential for those who are then you so that you charge your, the the EV charging station then gets called upon to put back into the grid um, in the evening? So that's an excellent question and one that we're exploring as well. But we did ask for it in our demand response uh, offering, but the department said no. It rightfully belongs in grid mod, not energy efficiency. So right now we're not able to offer that, but we're exploring how what role does it play in um, 
in grid modernization. It's very cost effective when you have a fleet of vehicles uh, to, to combination of both solar and EV charging stations. And then, then the next question is, what's the benefit? Does it reduce the peak? Uh, it, are there any savings? And how do those savings then get sp spread out? So our next steps on this, I've talked about. We've communicated some of the compacts um, comments and position on grid modernization. We, the board will participate in the docket. And we are looking at how we can, to the best of our ability, incorporate grid modernization into energy efficiency programs, and then looking to collaborate with other stakeholders on this subject. So that ends my presentation, if you have any qu questions. And again, from especially on the grid mod, I want to, it's more, this is what we're working on and not sure where this is going, but I just wanted to make sure that the board um, and you know that Bob is working very hard on this subject. Okay, questions, gentlemen, from the public? Jim. Mr. Schofield and I have met, talked about this and mentioned it. I've been exposed to it in the past off-peak metering to shift the load to a low generation period where say at 11 o'clock your per kilowatt hour charge and usage you roast the chicken at 11 or the turkey and do the ham you do the washing machine you do the dryer you do all the you charge up fully the 80 gallon water tank you do all that heavy usage at an off-peak hour to shift the load and at a lower rate, but it's not available here at this time. That's a little bit what our demand response pilot will be focusing on um, is to gauge participation, but you are correct. That's what grid modernization is about, is about time of use rates and smart meters and to make sure that people are, that they have the, the appropriate rate scale to encourage people to shift load. Question, Tom? Well, we had, we've had two citizens call, and I'm not sure this is an appropriate question, Maggie, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Apparently, they believe that Eversource has come down and installed smart meters on their home, um, a different type of, and they haven't approved of that? No, they, um, Eversource does not install or have a residential smart meter available. Okay. If you participate in the Cape Light Compact's demand response, we actually had to do a workaround. So we have something called TED, the energy detective, which actually is affixed to the meter so that we can all a smart, what, what that gives is gives us real time usage so that you can we can track it and you'll know when to shift. But Eversource does not have um, smart meters available. Okay, so, so the Cape Light Compact has a, if you're a customer of the Cape Light Compact. And you're one of the 200 customers that we haven't, once oh, we roll that program okay. out, then you would have a TED. Then I, 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 that, all right, I need to get back to them then because yeah. I don't quite get. There could be some confusion on this, Tom. We, uh, we didn't change the meters, but Eversource did a couple of years ago. No, this for was everybody. The, no, this is the last couple of months. Okay, no, that was the only thing I can think of. One other point that I've been talking about for the last 15 years, as we all know, the population on the Cape grows at roughly 2% a year. And since the Cape Light Compact started in 1997, our actual kilowatt hour usage on the Cape has been stagnant. We have had no growth at all. And that's the major thing that the CAPE stands for is to meet the demands by not requiring us to go out and get more power for the CAPE. And it shows when you can cite a fact like that. A, a question, or a, a, at least for a request for information. Uh, last year, if you went into a Lowe's or a Home Depot, there was a gentleman standing there from Solar City or from one other of the other many, many uh, vendors that were selling instantaneous solar collectors for your roof and you had a choice of getting something for nothing and they would come in and do it and they'd give you something less or you could buy it and get everything at once um, and now I've heard a lot of talk about um, not having energy credit or net credits or something that are no longer available 
Could you comment on what the status is of what's going to happen for solar collectors and so forth? Will that be coming back? And is there an easy way for a homeowner to get involved with solar without having to, without having to go through this, this very irregular? I mean, it's almost like going into buying a used car someplace because there's eight or nine different guys doing it. They all have different contracts. Um, it's, it's a horrible way to, to try to bring energy efficiency or, or alternative energy sources to, a, to, to the poor homeowner. It is a black mark. So there are two things. One is the legislation relative to expanding the cap is pending. So I actually, it would have been a great question to ask Representative Vieira because he's more, way more knowledgeable on this subject than I would than I am. So there, that's there is um, legislation and it hasn't passed yet to increase the the net meet the, the cap. Um, on S, because you not only have the energy, you also have the attributes, which are called RECs. So um, you're at getting to capacity at the ability to take um, S REC 2s, I believe they're called. And then the other thing you talked about, uh, Mr. Chairman, is whether you lease or whether you um, buy your solar panels. Um, and also, how do you, you also need to, this is another one that you need to take a really hard look at what you use and how you if, you, if you're not heating with electricity and you are pretty efficient in your home, meaning you have high efficiency appliances, a high efficiency um, uh, heating system and all LEDs or CFLs and you're using <coughs> less than 500 kilowatt hours, you have to, it's a, it becomes an economic issue. Mm -hmm. Really, what is the payback on doing solar for such a small, a small load um, there but then again if somebody has an empty, a, a nice piece of a lot you could do a ground mounted solar and you have the ability to do neighborhood net meet net metering so the best right now I would think the best source to go to would be the clean energy center formerly mass technology collaborative because they're they're, they're not good they're not selling anything they're going to give a, um, a resident or a business just facts in which to make a decision but it's there's it's 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 complicated and it is I think I agree with what Bob said it kind of has given a little bit of a, a mark there because you have solar on well I'm I'm using somebody else's solar who made too much with a Z schedule and and it works out real well uh, those are the uh, and I get myself probably two or three phone calls a week trying to sell me on the same type mm -hmm. of thing that you mentioned but what they're basically doing is renting your roof and all the profit and everything goes to them uh, I can't I won't quote this as, as a specific on one supplier but I've had many phone calls on this and most of the contracts that I have read or have been interpreted to me you start at a low figure of nine or ten cents a kilowatt hour but the end of that contract it it won't exceed 24 cents a kilowatt hour. And as a, as a side to this, and when we have more capacity, if you buy that system, and with the present SREC uh, payments, it'll pay for itself in four or five years. And you can get also a either low interest or no interest loan to pay for those. The state has just passed legislation on that. And anybody that I have, uh, the Energy Committee three years ago was one of the first communities in the state. And we pushed this because we got a lot of help from the state. And we sold on people in Bourne uh, about 28 installations. But the best part of that was word of mouth, because we probably have 150 of them today from what we did three years ago. And I think 95% of those were purchased. purchased. Actually, you should, we should there, I totally forgot about that. The uh, DOER, the Division of Energy Resources, has now a low interest loan. They modeled it after the heat loan for those um, who are interested, residential customers who are interested in solar. So if you went to their website, they have, it, that's a really great site for just facts and information for trying to make a decision. Okay, thank you both. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you for your support. Uh, we're here because of each town on the Cape and the Vineyard, and it's paid off very handsomely. Thank you. Very good. Thank, thank you, you both very much. Very, very much. Okay. We have the uh, next agenda item is the uh, appointment of election workers. Mr. Mr. Chairman, we have a uh, 
know, six or eight names here. Um, so I would, there are different um, <coughs> classifications. So I would move the following names as election worker and checker for a term expiring June 30, 2016, and they are Kathy E. Doherty, Eileen P. Grady, Kathleen R. Letzian, Marjorie L. McClung, and Mary E. Sachiko. I'm sorry. Sikio. Sikio. Second. Okay, I've got a motion that's been made and seconded to nominate those individuals as election worker or checker and checker. Is there any further discussion on that motion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Motion carries unanimously. The following two people, Mr. Chairman, I would nominate uh, as requested by the town clerk to be election workers, checker, as well as clerks for terms expiring June 30, 2016, Mary Ellen Kozar and Ann R. Walushu. Second. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. I have a motion that's been made and seconded to nominate those individuals as an election worker slash checker slash clerk with a, an expiration of a term in June 30, 2016. Is there any further discussion on that motion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 aye opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Mr. Chairman. Um, I will send this down. Uh, included in your signatory file this evening is also a letter of regret um, and appreciation uh, to Martha Reinhardt for serving on the Conservation Commission. So you can just sign all of this as it comes through. Thank you very much. Under Selectman's business, um, we have uh, goals with the possible adoption. I'd also like if there's members of the board uh, that would like to bring up any comments relative to the 2017 budget. Um, what I'd like to do is just, if there's questions or something that we need to get answered, let's either discuss them quickly this evening or get them so we can cover them in two weeks. We have a meeting on the 9th, uh, the first being election night, so our next meeting will be on the 9th. Um, I'd like to take a formal vote on that evening uh, to formally pass the baton over to the Finance Committee, although they do have a copy of the, uh, of the uh, budget as it was submitted. Um, as you might recall, we all asked uh, if there were any comments and so forth from many our, of our board members a week ago, and there were none. So, um, why don't we go ahead and get started with uh, goals and possible adoptions? Now, within the packet, uh, right, was an email. Excuse me. Right. We have hard copy. It's right there. There's okay. three that way and one this way. Okay. So these are there's our goals uh, for the year 2015-2016, um, divided into several broad categories. Let me read them off for the. Uh, uh, for, the, for the public. Under organizational, we have a, looking at efficiencies, um, looking at a town organizational taught economic development and environmental. Well, under efficiencies, to work closely, and I'll, I'll just read this off and we can take it under discussion. And then I think the proper thing would do it would be to open it up to discussion for everything and then ask the board if they'd like to adopt or and make any changes. Under organizational efficiencies, work closely on the scope of collective bargaining for all bargaining units. As you know, all of our um, contracts are up this year. Look at what fleet management software the town is currently using and ascertain if new software systems might be needed or warranted. And continue to review possibilities of regionalization services. <coughs> Under the organizational chart, chart, to review proposed organizational chart as, as provided by the town administrator and conduct work sessions before the town election on any recommended changes in makeup as presented. And to move forward with hearings per the town charter by August of 2016 under economic development to move forward with the wastewater committee and consult consultancy of the wastewater treatment plant for Buzzards Bay. Also to host a workshop or a seminar in conjunction with the Chamber of Commerce at a uh, topic of growing your business. And under environmental, continue to work with the Cape Cod Commission on the 208 re related issues and engage the, the Cape Cod Commission to, uh, reset team and to work with the uh, landfill staff and recycling groups to bring forward a plastic bag ban bylaw by town meeting in the spring. This is to seek other town re uh, restrictions and create a matrix by April 2nd of 2016. So those are the goals that we went over briefly um, at a workshop we had had last year and I would open it up to the board for discussion, particularly Mr. Um, Blanton and Mr. Meyer who had worked on this and make a presentation to the board. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, with regard to the notes that we have here, um, 
A number of the items have been discussed and some have either been, uh, we've been worked on or they're set to be worked upon. Uh, in particular, I, I, I look down the list, I mean, obviously, you know, since, since I came on board, I've, been, I've talked an awful lot about economic development, the importance on uh, growth potential for the town. Um, we have a list of a couple of projects here that may be helpful in that regard. I'm uh, I'm still of a mind that I, I wish we could do something more, and I know we're talking about budgetary allocations that may not be available in FYs moving forward, but I would like to try to entertain ways we may be able to think about that or entertain growing that list. I'm still thinking about the prospect of trying to engage some sort of an economic development officer and for us to commit to trying to find some level of funding to support that type of a coordinated position. That, that's my thought. With the advent, you know, with <coughs> the MBTA, you know, coming on board at some point, and with the redevelopment of the Buzzard Bay Park and the planning stages and property owners now looking at new projects, if it's Vinnie Machenzi, if it's 25 Perry Ave, if it's um, Bobby Gendron, you know, as a possibility as well. I think in order to keep the the ball rolling, the, you know, of, of, of positive development, I think an economic development officer or position is something that's long overdue. We have um, eventually, we you know, not say eventually, we need to create new growth and new tax revenue without the possibility of an override. And the way to do that is new growth. And if an economic development officer brings in potential developers or property owners to develop, and you know it's a win-win for everybody so i think and i mean especially in this economy i think economic development is at the top of the list of any goal uh, because without it we're just going to be a dormant community and it's a shame because we have assets here that we need to to push into into um make prominent and corinne doesn't have the resources to do it so we need to look to get it help to get it done Okay. Then I'm going to nominate Mr. Blinn and Mr. Marr to take on the economic development as the liaison. <laughs> I'll second that. <laughs> All right, let's pencil in Mr. Meyer and Mr. Blinn, unless there's any objections by either of you. No, I think they both bring up good points, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Please. Um, but what I'd like to get back to is if we can kind of rein this in a bit. These goals were supposed to be done 45 days after, uh, yeah. after uh, the... Uh, election of the new board and I think we should I, I appreciate the fact that they've reined everything in with Mr. Garino I think it's doable I think it's workable to uh, from from all sides and I would move approval as presented thank you very much Mr. Picard is there a second to the motion to approve the goals as presented yes thank you I've got a motion made and a second is there any further comments on that uh, discussion sure please Mr. Ellis uh, I, I do believe there's a, the importance of an economic development officer uh, to come on board, but be careful what you wish for. Uh, don't load it on to somebody else who's already trying to do a good job with uh, some other department who's uh, allegedly overworked at the particular time. I think if it's going to be someone, it should be a separate person uh, who this board approves as a background that we can look at and make that judgment. Uh, and I think it's important that if we do go forward, we have to remember in the back of our minds uh, that uh, the overpass, uh, excuse me, the override was not passed. People are questioning the uh, <coughs> salaries of people that are making a lot of money in this town. I brought that up six, eight, nine months ago, and you don't want to get yourself into a position where you appoint this position to some other officer who all of a sudden goes from 80,000 to 100,000, I think it's better to have an in, one individual who can devote 24-7 to this instead of just part of his time or her time to this on a daily basis. It certainly is well uh, reasoned, well researched, and I do believe it should work. And you have a couple of very good standing committees that are in existence right now, but I think it needs to be a, a position that this person deals with only. So that's all they're dealing with and not worrying about other things that are going on in town. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. 
Mr. Meyer? Yeah, and in part of our goals, it says to host a work of a workshop or seminar in conjunction with the chamber or any other, um, you know, people who have interest in that. And hopefully that will happen in the next month to six weeks. So, you know, so it's part of that workshop for economic development. You know, we can look at what the options are and, and to grow forward. Mr. Bland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if I might ask my fellow colleague to my left, was that a suggestion then that we want to amend this list to include a discussion into looking into how to create an opportunity for a full-time economic I, development officer with the I, town? I, I think uh, my, my I'd point. i support that. Yes. I, I think the thing is to uh, agree with what's been put forward. And then when you break down these different individual things to go forward with it at that particular time, because, I, excuse me. No, I didn't mean my, my, my mistake. Yeah. Uh, be, it, because I think it's important that we do uh, get these uh, uh, four items under a vote so that we can go forward. Uh, and then uh, with the economic development, which I think is long overdue, uh, but I honestly believe it should be a singular officer who deals with that in a singular job, not piggybacked. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Guarino. I, I would fully concur with the comments of uh, Mr. Ellis. And I think if the, you look at a, the proposal on organization, not um, from the planning department, that there is a, uh, a separate individual economic development officer that would be distinct and separate from uh, any other particular position we have currently in the organization. So um, I think you're, you're spot on, uh, Mr. Ellis and Mr. Meyer, uh, Mr. Blanton, as you look at that. My concern um, on that for the current fiscal year is uh, where does it come from? Um, we need to talk about that and, and figure that out because it's not in the budget. It's not proposed to be in the budget unless the selectmen uh, direct that that position be placed in the budget somewhere. But it'll be at the exp we'll have to figure it out. And I'm certainly willing to sit down and work with the board and try to make that happen if that's what you decide you want to do. Thank you, Mr. Carino. If I if I could say, Mr. 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 Chairman, yep. excuse me for jumping sure. in, no, no. but in, in answer to the gentleman to my right. As he brought forward, uh, I, I think we should vote on the on the four issues and then uh, underneath the uh, organizational chart, uh, economic development go forward under that and then a point in a time frame uh, to be uh, in the near future. I'd just like to add a comment relative to economic development. We missed an opportunity uh, last week with the non-passing of the changing of the regulations uh, for B3 zoning. And I think that the biggest concern, at least what, what I saw from watching the town meeting, was the, uh, the concern that people had with <coughs> a particular board having as much power as it's determining it, and maybe a, lim a height limit or something. But I would think, if nothing else, we, we should take awareness of that issue and recognize that there may be some type of a compromise that can be put forth in the spring yet again to try to bring up that change. because. As we know, the alternative is to go through a variance procedure for any applicant that might want to develop that property, which we've now changed to B3 successfully, and it's going to be difficult. And I think if you're going to talk economic development, let's do the easy stuff first. Not that that's the easiest thing, but we can do that at a town meeting, and I think we can approach it with the understanding of what we learned at the last town meeting. So I think that should be part of our priority within economic development, to work with the various boards and the town planner to make sure that we come with something that's uh, comprehensible and also acceptable to the voters so well with that article going down the same article can't come up for two years on the mass general law so anything that goes forward it's going to be have to be different than what was voted on that's correct I'm not suggesting we bring the same thing back because I think we get the same results but are you suggesting mr. chairman that we amend no section? I'm just saying I'm just saying let's not forget you know the possibility that there are other things besides hiring people that may result in economic development that's all um, there's a motion on the, on the table that's been moved and seconded to adopt uh, these uh, lists of goals. Uh, I think they're broad enough that a lot of the things that we've discussed uh, could be added to and included within those. I, I would offer to take the environmental as a liaison 
if it's acceptable to the board, I, I have worked with the uh, recycling committee. Um, in fact, there's a couple of members in the recycling committee that have offered to take this under their wing to work on it as well. So uh, I think we can be well, well prepared as a town to offer the townspeople at the spring town meeting uh, an all, a, a good means of way to address uh, the concern about plastic bags. So I'd be happy to take the organizational chart. Okay. Everybody's jumping up and down about efficiency with collective bargaining. <laughs> well, I, think well, I have something. asked. I, think, I have I think, asked. The, the, I think, yeah. for, for transparency to the board members, I have asked the chair and the vice chair to sit down with me to work on parameters to come back with, to the board for full discussion as we move forward and ahead on these uh, collective bargaining agreements. So. Um, we're not trying to take anything away from the full board, but it's easier um, to try to decipher some of these languages and then bring it back to the board for their dis review and discussion. I hope the board would support that <coughs> um, model. Um, it's and as we uh, nothing on any of the contracts would be uh, voted or discussed or implemented without the full board's knowledge, consent, and full discussion. But we have eight contracts to do and it just makes a lot of sense to try to do that um, in a subcommittee type organization and I have for ease I've asked the chair and the vice chair but I was certainly would be welcome to anybody wanting to come in any comments gentlemen on that I, I for one uh, I don't know that I want to necessarily serve as an official liaison it sounds like that's already been taken on up but I, I would certainly appreciate the opportunity to sit in on that if nothing on if nothing else uh, to learn a little bit more hands-on on how this collective bargaining actually works on a negotiation. Well, then you're level. going to have to post a meeting, so I'll step off. You can have it. I was going to, well, no, I'm fine. I don't care. Well, I, I don't want to no, necessarily not believe me. Believe me. <laughs> believe me. I, don't need, I don't need more meetings. I'm, yeah. sure, I'm sure they'll miss you. No, these I'm would sure they won't. Be, uh, just for Mr. Blanton's understanding, these would hopefully be daytime meetings. That's, and that's one of my challenges. So, so that's why I, I would respectfully beg off of um, being an official liaison. But if there's an opportunity to not break, not create a. Uh, oh, you, you, you'd, have you'd have to post a to meeting. If we have three, we'll have to post a meeting. I understand. Yep. I'm sorry. I, nope. I thought it would be helpful. That's all. Nope. Understood. I well, think we'll I just think have a full discussion when it comes on. I'll be able to be part of the learning process then, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, Jerry, I haven't got your name next to anything. Is there anything you want to hang your hang on? I just want to kind of support a little bit of everything. I will support everybody if there they allow go. me to come along. Perfect. Okay. I so I need a vote. So I've got, uh, just to run it down, I've got under efficiencies uh, with the uh, collective bargaining. That would be myself and Don. The organizational <laughs> chart is Don. Economic development is Michael and Peter, and environmental is me. And then Jerry is everywhere. So Love having it. said that, and there's a motion to approve uh, these. this outline as our uh, goals for 2015-2016. Efficiencies were who again? Steve and Don. Mr. Blant looking over our shoulders. <laughs> Whenever I can. All right. Any other questions or comments? I would I would request that because I'm going to be multitasked here that I be notified on whenever and all the meetings. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> the whole board will be. We'll make sure that happens, Don. That's a good point. All right. Are we ready to vote, gentlemen? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. On, the, so, on the selectman's business, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, there's going to be a couple things. Go ahead, Dutch. Uh, um, Peter. Last year, this time we were given full-time equivalents from every department head um, for the money for the money that was the year before, year present, and possibly projecting out to the year after, based on how many employees, what would it, what the title was, and, and their, their rate of pay. Um, I think for, for 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 transparency, I would like to see those again this year. Those are coming forward. Mr. Picard actually asked recently of the for the salary structure. Um, so we're putting that together. He asked for that by the first meeting in March. Um, and the FTEs um, are being provided right now to the Finance Committee as well, as you're, as you're aware. So as the departments bring that um, forward, we'll just, we'll just make sure that the selectmen are copied on, on that as well. Um, and, and also, I, I, mean, I gave you a question last week relevant to the revolving account. 
Yes, we're getting you the answer on that. Linda was gone last week, as you recall, yeah. so uh, you will have the you wanted the recreation revolving account. Um, Credit and balance. What what salaries are paid out of it? Correct. What bills are paid yeah. out of it? Um, that's fairly easily ascertained. Um, thank you. Any questions about the budget? Yeah, go ahead. Go on. I just have a, a couple of points I'd like to make, then some questions as well for the administrator. Uh, for example, if the audit company tells the finance director, FY17, the audit's going to cost $60,000, I presume that the $60,000 is budgeted. Yes. And then why, in, if the fire chief was notified that county dispatch service was going to be 176000 thereabouts, and he requested that, why did you change that amount down to one twenty five? Meeting that I had with the sheriff that I reported to the selectmen a few weeks ago, it looked like it was going to be level funded. Oh, really? Yes. Okay, didn't recall that. Okay. Um, finance department, line 5215, payroll services in the amount of $60,000 so that we can automate uh, and save time with, with, uh, with a payroll service within that department. Uh, and I understand that there is no, uh, at present, no reduction within the finance department to offset that $60,000 for that contractual expenditure of the payroll service. That's correct. What is happening there is we're um, offsetting a module that we currently buy with um, was soft right now called Excel, I believe, with ADP. Um, there is no necessarily corresponding reduction in workload with perhaps, because uh, everything has to be still inputted from our office and balanced out. So the finance director and I are more than happy. I don't have all of the information in front of me this evening, Mr. Picard, but we're more than happy to come in and explain that in great detail to you on the 9th. Uh, that's that's fine, but I, I, if something's supposed to make things more efficient, and we still have the same number of people doing it, why are we doing this? Now, I understand it has something perhaps to do with making sure that we comply with the well, the the ACA, right? Yeah, the uh, yeah the, the, the affordable health care. Affordable health care, but you know, it, 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 I think it should be the boards. The board should look at it. The board should question it, and the board should say. And the board could say that it is the selectman's position and, and and as a broad policy statement could say that you know we want the administrator to find a location within the finance department budget to eliminate another sixty thousand dollars to offset that i'd like to have that as a an agenda item or something if you're going to have the finance director bring in because frankly if we're spending sixty thousand on something that's supposed to make a department more efficient have somebody else do the payroll why do we still, you know, why well, do we not you, cut staff? It, it, That's, but you can okay. answer that later. Yeah. Um, I wish these had been asked during the, so I could. Well, you know something? I, I met with uh, the police chief, the fire chief, and the ice room director with Mr. Ellis on two, myself alone. Uh, and then I've been trying to sit in with capital, and we're going to do that mm -hmm. tomorrow morning. So I've had a chance to sit down and look at some of these things, and I just, some of these things I just got wind of. Okay. And, and that's why I'm bringing it up. Now, I want to bring up some, a couple other things. Number one, total legal budget for FY17 is 317000 Now, in checking around, I just saw that Braintree just advertised for a town council in-house. Braintree is a population of 35,000 people. The salary range is 107 to 125. Arlington has a full-time town council at 35 hours a week with a salary of approximately 130. Now, I believe it's our fiduciary responsibility as a board to examine the way we're doing business with regard to town council. I mean, 317, uh, you know, we might save $100,000 if we looked at doing it this way. Now, I'm not saying cut Troy out, let him, let him become that person if, if he wants. If not, it's fine. That's another question. Emergency preparedness, the department head, according to the budget book, put in a request for 89.75 for salary for the department head. You raised it back to 18,128. So my question is, if the department head feels that $8,975 is adequate to do the function, 
with a reduced amount of hours, why would you raise the amount by $10,000? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Let me answer that. The original proposal when the override failed was to cut that person down to a point where I don't believe it was sustainable, but it was something we had to do to cut the budget. The request in that line item should have been raised. It, should, it shouldn't have been at 89. We had discussed it. It is my belief, based on the workload that he has undertaken in the professional is in the, regardless if it's him, if he retires out or anybody else, we need a half-time person in our EMS system. And uh, I will be more than happy to justify that in spades to you on the 8th as well. Well, I'm looking around. I do a lot by comparison. The emergency management director in Sandwich, who, has very, who is very highly regarded, does it for a stipend of under $5,000. In Yarmouth, it's the town manager or his assistant that just has the title. Uh, in Falmouth, it was just recently the recently retired retired fire chief. I think we have to look at this as another way. I'm, I'm not saying you know maybe this year we take we revert it back to the 8975, and then see what happens after that. But that's just another point that I want to make. But I really think that that, and I'll be glad to send these to you by email. I appreciate that. Um, now look, I'm one of two veterans on the board, but I have to ask questions about the veterans agent services. We pay $150,000 for expenditures for veterans and other charges. I'd like, to, I'd like to get some idea of how that's broken down. Okay. Is it for medical? Is it for he heating assistance or, or whatever? That, that would be good. The other thing is we have a veteran's agent who's a, this, a veteran's agent is assessed. Assessment to the town is $29,926. That's six hours a week. At 52 weeks a year for that six hours, that equates to $96 per hour for that person to sit in the office and, and address veterans' issues. I'm wondering if we should not look at, a, you know, maybe the town taking that over no, and, I, or something of that nature. I, I understand Mr. Merrigan's the one who signs off on all the, all the procedures because he's trained in that regard, but I know the VA and others have trained people. So. Yeah, why, we have been in, I don't have a good response okay. to that because we've been in this um, multi-town system yeah. with Barnstable County for years right. and years. Oh, I, I get it, but 96 bucks an hour. No, I don't think it's good. specifically, <laughs> I think that a lot of that goes to the admin of the full okay. system right. as well. But Fine. Um, community building, you have a contracted services line item for $50,000. Now I'm going to presume that's custodial. Mostly, yes. And you also have a labor's line item for $50,000. Can you tell me how many FTEs that is? Is that one FTE? One FTE. One FTE, okay. And so, and how did you arrive at the $50,000? That the was based on the numbers we had asked when we were to be open. We asked Jonathan to put together what it would cost to bring back uh, the five days with the six hours of contracted services on each of the days mm -hmm. um, at an hourly rate with an outside vendor. All right, let's move down to my last concern and qu uh, question because, I, you know, again, I'm just trying to figure out what's, if we're doing the right thing. Um, page 631.75, Recreation Department. You have salaries totaling 106000 No expenses are listed for that department. So if that department needs a phone or postage or advertising, where does that come from? It comes out of the revolving fund. It comes out of the money they raise in fees. That was explained before the override that all of the expense money would be taken out of the recreation and all programs would be fee-based and all expenses for the recreation department would be taken out of that as well as about 45 percent of one salary uh, okay. comes out of the revolving account as well. And the recreation department runs SWISH, summer camp, and lifeguards. And a number of other programs, they do a number of, uh, I can get you the full list of programs. Yeah, I like that. that. Okay. That's good. Because I, I, I'm just I'm just looking at through all these things, and, and while you say it's, it's fee based and we're collecting money and it's a revolving account, mm -hmm. regardless of where it comes from, we're paying it and we're paying it out. So I, I sometimes I wonder if, it, especially when you have a department with very little in expenses and one hundred and six thousand dollars in salaries, I'm I'm not, I'm not sure that. Um, you know, we might not want to restructure or look at a restructuring of that. I, 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 I would venture to guess that they would be more than happy to have some expense money back in their accounts. Yeah, I, no doubt. I, I, and I, I, you know, this is not a two-person recreation department on a, a 
Cape Town for 20,000 to 40,000 people is yeah, well, pretty much the norm, but we can look at it and certainly be more than willing to discuss anything you'd like on that. Well, we've got a lot coming up in the next couple of years, and I you know, just want to make sure that we're doing the best in addressing our fiduciary responsibility to the community. And, I, um, I appreciate that. You know, some, you know, if we're gonna have to, and we've all said last last couple of meetings on this, it's the only place else you're gonna do cut is in salaries, as in in personnel. And you've been cutting personnel continually right. for the last four to five years. I get it. I know. Thank you. I will email this to all members of the board. I appreciate that, so I can have yep. it. Thank sure. you. Anything else, gentlemen, relative to Jerry? Uh, under Slickman's report. Uh, Oh, wait a minute, I want to, you're skipping over the town administration. I, excuse report. me, Slickman's business. Okay, go ahead, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank uh, you, sir. This, this may be a fair line between business and a report, but I, I, I would like it under business. Uh, and knowing full well that Mr. Carino works on the, uh, he's the everyday person responsible for everything, but I'm concerned uh, about Friday, sometimes late on the afternoon, uh, going into uh, town hall, we have an excellent, excellent group of secretaries. And on a number of occasions I've gone in and secretaries are going wild trying to get up reports to get out that have come from chairman or business people and other committees uh, that they want this now, uh, spreadsheets, things of that nature. Uh, I think it was a policy that I remember voting on at one time uh, that uh, things would be done before uh, a secretary had to work over. And I was, I've was i seen a number of instances recently where secretaries have worked up till 5 o'clock trying to get this report out. I think that's uh, not a good practice. I think uh, if a, a group or a committee or someone wants information, it should be submitted to Mr. Garino for his approval. Uh, it should be done uh, as best as possible uh, through Thursday, uh, not at a time frame on Friday that would create a situation where these people would have to work over, uh, to wait until Monday. And I believe that may have been a we voted policy a, that we voted at one time. We voted, a, uh, well, I don't believe it was voted, Mr. Ellis, it, w it was voted. It was uh, back in November. I brought forward a communication and request uh, protocol that was voted by I don't recall it being voted but done in both of you I think it, so. I think it was yeah. yeah I think it was um, in November of 2015 well and, I would uh, I would if, if if I might mr. chairman I respectfully request that uh, uh, Tom that you uh, implement that and let these people know that if they want this material they either have to wait till Monday or there's a four to, there's a four day turnaround right uh, well, not to put any excessive pressure on these secretaries it's not called for they do an outstanding job and we're very fortunate and most of most boards and committees have been very good about that particular um, compliance and I will just send it back out to all boards and committees for reminder purposes thank you sir thank you Jerry thank you mr. Chairman. absolutely also um, go ahead here yeah we haven't seen the town administrator's report for a while. What is the status of that? Um, we should be doing that. It's a time. I, I will try to find time to do that. It's something that was requested by the board. Okay. Anything else, gentlemen? I, well, I, we, I can wait till the town administrator's report and then ask him a question. You can ask it now if you'd like. Right, uh, are, are we in compliance with the municipal health insurance proposed regulations timetable that was presented to us in yes we are we're actually the uh, that was something I was going to report out on briefly this evening um, we are in fact all the letters went out everything was brought back in time um, to answer the question where we plan to have the first meeting first week of March and within seven days of that the committee needs to be established where we will be presenting to the to them um, the uh, proposal that you saw uh, in the, not too long ago, and then we negotiations commence from there. Thank you. If I might, Tom, when you say we are going to meet the first week, that would be the treasurer, okay. the uh, consultancy, and uh, myself. Okay. Very good. What is the status of a? I know we talked about this probably for the last year. Plus, for health care or a health insurance committee. Well, this is what this 
when you adopted 21 through 23, you're setting up a health care committee. Yeah, but I know I know we were looking at retired, you know, employees, retirees. And this has a retiree and, on it as well. As well as at large? Uh, no, this is set up by the statute. This is statutorily set up. When you adopted this, you adopted the committee that was explained to you? No, there is not. It is the bargaining units, management, and a retiree. Thank you. Kind of brings us up to your report, Tom, which I think you've pretty much flogged. <laughs> Bang! Uh, <laughs> um, I, I wanted to just report uh, the, the Mr. Meyer asked a question relative to the tip earlier. Um, I was at the MPO meeting um, yesterday, uh, and uh, I'll explain tip for the uh, <coughs> transportation improvement program. I'm sorry. No, nope, no. Nope. Um, it just it's it's for the the region um, Belmont uh, Circle Rotary um, is looking at FY I believe 18 or construction year 19 be, they're waiting for the Cape Cod transportation study to be completed um, and they are, are going to they've held off things until that report is completed and then they can move forward on any particular improvements I do believe they're going to do some uh, restricting the line painting and that thing in, in the 18 uh, year. Um, Does that tip uh, take into account the arrival of the MBTA and the proposed? Yeah, it, it, everything is being con considered in that. Great, uh, but I did want to hand out uh, <coughs> relative to the tip something that we were notified of on Friday or Thursday and we discussed it uh, at the, at the uh, MPO meeting. Um, yesterday it deals with new signing that the state wants to put out MPO mr. Uh, uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization I'm sorry no, I'm just trying to keep everybody yeah, with their um, bed soup that's all. and as the chair of the RTA I, I have a seat at that particular table that's the regional um, transit authority correct yeah. uh, mr. You're, you're, you're this is tough yeah, mr. <laughs> mr. Ellis from sandwich is our representative for the four upper Cape towns so Ciao. So, and he was, so I just wanted to hand these out to you, uh, and I, I was, um, oh, I heard about this. Yeah, this is kind of uh, it's like stripping the median strip to make it. Well, easier. no, no, no. If you look at what they're they're proposing, and, and while it says sandwich to East Ham, they're actually going to go into what the 195 corridor too. So I'm assuming it's going to come down 25, but they're going to change the exits from the number of exits to the mile marker, okay? As well as changing the type of signage that is on there. Okay, <laughs> now I, I, I want it very, and if you look at the bottom, they are proposing to take away the comfort signs of, uh, you know, diesel or gasoline or restroom or food or hotel or airport uh, as well. And, um, this is something that the state is is doing it is it's kind of a, a national type thing that's happening if you go into Maine they're done that way now on, on 95 you know but uh, I believe the exits are done by mile marker now or exit 6a and I think it was in south in, in Portland is now exit you know 35 or 40 wherever <coughs> they have the mileage up there um, yes so I, I I'm letting you know this we just were made aware of it uh, Lance Lambros from Senator DiMasito's office was at the MPO yesterday and was quite um, um, firm that the CAPE delegation um, as a delegation uh, was not supporting this um, given the tri given the uh, tourist you know with all of the brochures that are in all the hotels and all of the uh, tourist type or vacationers type they, they've already had you know there's a lot of money that's spent on their brochures and a lot on their promotional materials on how to get from point A to point B um, and that you know transcends into the web-based systems and, and, and other things as well so um, there's not a lot of discussion on this I just wanted the board to be aware that this was out there and uh, we were made aware of it formally on Monday, although we got an email on it Friday. Mr. Glenn. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Quick question here in the notes. I notice just look at the, the uh, total cost for this uh, retrofit is five point eight million dollars. I think I believe that's. Uh, I don't want to say for sure, but I believe that's district wide, not just in this area. Um, I, I don't know if I know it's not statewide. It would be more than that statewide, but. Um, I'm encouraged to hear that the Cape delegation, I mean, not that I would want to um, ever challenge uh, whatever blue panel, blue ribbon panel of uh, Ivy League transportation experts came up with this particular plan, but uh, Well, I it think looks you're right. I think it's for the Cape in the 195 quarter, as I read that. So. Absolutely spendthrift and unnecessary and foolish. But. Well, I, I just wanted you to be aware, because we are the gateway, um, and... Uh, I mean, you still come down to 25 and exit two, formally exit one. I mean, or exit one, formally exit two. So, uh, I, so that that was um, one of the things that I wanted to bring the board up to date about. Um, I just Ellis, before we leave that, Mr. Ellis, comment. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. It's fine. I'm I'm very much appreciative of your bowing to age. <laughs> uh, the one thing on here that is a little bit and disturbing and uh, Mr. Blanton's correct if you take a look at the at the directional sign to the far right on the ones on the bottom airport they've changed the entrance to the Hyannis airport and I would defy you if you're not familiar with it to go down there and find your way into that airport now uh, and if you're a, a tourist and you go down and you're looking for it if you don't know that you can go in beside Wendy's or you, you can go in at another entrance, you're not going to find this place. Uh, you go around the existing rotary a couple times, and they're all exits. So I think your point's well taken, and that makes it a point for you to have a good argument. So thank you. Okay. I, I, I'm not sure we're going to have any opportunity to have an argument, but I just wanted to make the board aware of this being well, out there. If you want, if you want to fly out of Hyannis, God love you. Mr. Meyer. That's the first time I've seen a Republican and a Democrat agree on something. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if I might, Mr. Greeno, it, lo it looks like this has already been a, a project that has been funded. Yes. $5.8 million. Yet they're, they're planning a public hearing? Yes. It's, it's not a hearing to take testimony about why not to spend 5.8. It's just probably to fill us in on what they're going to do. That's my understanding. Yeah. Got it. That's even worse. Oh. So exit 2 is going to be exit 58. I'm just... just exit 5 will be exit 65. Go figure. Right. Thank you very much. I think we don't know yet <clears throat> but I, I did want to bring you up to date on that and I um, I think one of the talk shows this morning was having fun with that <coughs> so the other thing I just want to make public um, w as you know the Board of Selectmen have agreed and signed on to the uh, inter-municipal agreement relative to resident beach stickers with the town of Sandwich for the 200 up to 200 stickers they will be available to born residents on March 1st, starting March 1st. First come, first serve, first 200. That's that's it. And we're creating stickers as well. Uh, he Tim has a system worked out for for it may be it's one of the uh, uh, state stickers, but they have they non-resident stickers. They have it. They have it figured out. They've got okay. it all straightened out. And, so and Tim's all set with that. If I may, Mr. Chairman, those those stickers will be available at Bourne Town Hall? At Sandwich Town Hall. Sandwich Town Hall, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, I know, Mr. I'm, I'm good. I'm a little... I'm good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I've lost my cup of coffee bet with the Vice Chairman about getting out by 9.15. Uh, Selectman's I, reports. I said 9.30. I know. That's why I lost. <laughs> uh, Selectman's report. Mr. Meyer, anything this evening? Actually, one high school basketball, boys basketball played earlier, the, the last home game um, earlier to this evening. They won 75 to 68. Um, so uh, because of a good record, a great record, this year most likely you may see a home playoff game. And our own David Laney, if you know Ray or um, – oh, God. Lisa Laney's son, Davey, scored 31 points. And for a kid that's small in size, he's an amazing player. You know, support your home team any way you can, regardless of the sport, if it's hockey or whatever sport it is. Anything, Mr. Uh, Ricard? 
No, sir, I'm fine. Thank All you. Right. Mr. Chairman, really briefly, I had a delightful opportunity uh, just a few days ago to meet with uh, three different Boy Scouts uh, over at Starbucks here, where we I was grilled on all things constitutional law, being a public official, and helped them uh, achieve uh, questions and answers and information they needed relative to their public service merit badge. And I will probably invite them at some point in time in the near future, being born residents, to come here and we can potentially recognize them and their efforts as Boy Scouts here in town. Very good. Thank you. I shall pass. Thank you. Pass? Okay. I've just got a couple of quick things. I went to the recycling committee meeting this morning and the, uh, as, as we all know that the uh, special town meeting passed the re single stream recycling article. And uh, there will be single stream recycling information on the town, DPW, and ISWM web pages. And it's down, I believe it's in the lower right hand corner on the Tom website? I believe it is. There's a, and then it'll start to, we're going to start to provide more and more information about single stream recycling, how it works, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the recycling committee itself is working hard along with the members of ISWIM to start putting together informational pamphlets which will be handed out at the uh, gate at, at, uh, at the landfill because things will change there as well. So that will start in earnest. Um, and I'd also like to mention that the uh, residential recycling um, Earth Day will be held on April 23rd from 8.30 till noon. That's at the uh, Ice Swim uh, uh, Residential Recycling Area as well. So is there anything else? Yeah, actually, you know, um, for, the, for the one viewer at home that's watching us, Nancy, Nancy is recovering, you know, from a procedure. And so she's watching us, you know, on TV tonight. So thank you, Nancy, and get back, get well and get back soon. Okay. Very good, thank you, Peter. Um, on any other business, I have one item I would like to bring up. Uh, it wasn't on the agenda, but I think it's important and I think we should take action on it this evening. This is from Patrick Marshall, the director of the library. He's asking that we declare March 11th as Pajama Day here in Bourne and recognize from the PJ Drive that's being undertaken at the library. They're having a, a program in the morning with, uh, I, I'm just reading this, folks, Toe Jam Puppet Band and the rec department that evening is having a movie and pizza night. So I would like a motion to declare that March 11th <coughs> is Pajama Day here in the town of Warren. So moved. So moved. Second. I've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, <laughs> gentlemen, of declaring March 11th as Pajama Day here in Warren, please <coughs> say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Good oh, luck. Do Mr. we have Marshall. to wear pajamas to pajamas? No, we do not have to wear pajamas. This is just, if you come to the pizza and movie night that evening here at the rec center, you'll get uh, free pizza and get to watch the movie, but all you have to do is bring a pair of pajamas. Are you taking part, part of the plunge if, if we are not successful? I am not part of that uh, at all, Mr. Meyer. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if there's no other business, is there a motion to adjourn for the evening? So right moved. Mic. Thank you very much. Motion's been made and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. All right. Aye. Thank you all, gentlemen, very much. Good night, everyone. Good night.